Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. And now, Story Time. When I was a young teen, there was a small forest fairly near our house. My neighbor and I would walk to it regularly to go build dens and play on the park near its edge. The land was clearly once part of an estate because it had an old 1900s looking swimming pool and bits of stone path dotted amid the undergrowth. We'd sometimes take other kids there and play chase games or pretend to be tribes people, sprinting through the thick foliage. It was a fun place to explore, especially after we discovered where the stash of crispy old woods porn was. It looked like it was from the 70s. Anyway, We'd been going there for about a year or so at weekends when we finally decided to take a big pair of garden shears to start clearing an area for our biggest den yet. We chose part of the forest that had always been blocked off to us because it was mostly surrounded by a thick wall of bamboo, overgrown from the place's time as an estate I think. The forest was a paradise just for us, we'd never ever seen anybody there other than us or people we brought. The porn in our dens were always exactly as we left them. But all the same, we figured cutting a secret way into the bamboo walled area would give the best protected den from strangers and barbarians and ninjas. It took us most of the day to cut our way in. When we'd made an arch to crawl through, we went in to find that we were in a clearing with only clovers growing in it, no taller plants, just a soft blanket of clovers. Dotted throughout were these odd little knee-high statues of fairies sitting on stone mushrooms playing harps and other instruments. Every single one had its face smashed off. In the center of the cramped clearing was a giant concrete-looking block. We kicked over one of the fairy statues on the way over to it, probably to demonstrate that we weren't scared. It was a giant rough stone coffin. Some ivy-like plant covered most of it but it clearly had a well-defined lid and a worn, unreadable inscription on the side. Adrenaline curious, we tried with all our might to lift the lid, but it must have weighed tons. The adrenaline wore off, we freaked out, and hurriedly walked back through to the play park where we sat and discussed our find for a bit. We decided the clearing was too den perfect to pass up, so the next day we returned with some old metal sheeting and plywood boards to build our shelter. It wasn't raining, but the day was heavily dark and overcast, so the woods were about at the darkest they could be during daytime. We got back into the clearing, started building, and got pretty far with it. After a little while my friend sort of yelped out an oh Jesus Christ. I turned to see him stood next to the coffin, it's giving me full body shivers just thinking about this, and it was open. The lid was slid off to one side just enough that a thin person could get through the gap. I ran over, stared into the gap, saw nothing but pitch dark, and whispered run. The wind rose and it started raining, so there was noise everywhere right at that moment. I've never experienced anything like it. We ran through the wood faster than we'd ever practiced in our tribe games. We never went back into those woods. Anyway. We went back earlier and everything was totally overgrown. Also seeing as I'm now 6 foot 5 inches it was even harder to move around. We managed to find some of the landmarks but every path I remember leading to or near the clover clearing was now gone. We spent a few hours getting lost and they're trying to find ways around the back of it, but unfortunately it looks like it's gone until some new kid cuts their way in. Oh. And of course the woodsporn has long since dissolved away. Sorry, no vampires, but I can tell you it was creepy, particularly the way that the clearing seemed inaccessible and the fact that that cabin seems to have sprung from nowhere. I understand that a story like this may come off as unbelievable, which is one of the reasons why I've never told anybody about it for quite a long time. With the entire world and the state that it is in, I figured now is probably a better time to share my story. Now, for a little information about myself, I'm 30 years old. I've been an active duty park ranger for the past six and a half years in one of America's national parks. Before that, I served four years in the US Marine Corps. During my tenure in both, 
I held numerous security clearances, received extensive training on protecting sensitive information, and worked with various federal agencies, including NSA and DHS, to name a couple. Those are just the outliers of things I've done and people I've worked with, but by no means do I consider it a bragging right. Basically, I know how to keep my mouth shut about sensitive information when necessary. Consider the fact that if there was a chance of somebody believing me or the story getting out in public, it would have happened by now, I'm sure. Now, let's get to the meat and potatoes. About five years ago, I was a very young ranger in one of our national parks, which I will not name. It's a very popular place for hikers and campers. At that time, my duties were pretty much relegated to being a rover, patrolling the trails and checking up on campsites. I was not a full-fledged ranger but more of an assistant. I would shadow and assist many of the rangers while on duty, doing various forms of work, including search and rescue. In addition to that, I was tasked with safety briefings when tours from the visitor centers brought in folks. At this point, it should be noted that most of my co-workers at this early stage of my career were much older than me, by double or triple. While I'm not trying to whine about this, it played a role in how things planned out later on. One morning during the summer season, I was asked to do safety briefings for a group of visitors who had been touring the area assigned to me that day. The briefing itself wasn't anything special, and everything went smoothly enough. After the tour, I went back to my usual trail and continued with what I needed to do. The trail was not anything too special, just yet another trail looping around the base of the mountain leading off into some woods. A couple of other trails were branching off, but they were pretty unnoticeable unless you were specifically looking for them. A few hours later, I finished up all my tasks and decided to take a nice break on one of our overlooked points, kind of like an observation deck. It was nice, with a shade covering over half of it, making sitting very comfortable. After sitting down, I noticed somebody coming down the trail behind me in the distance. I didn't pay much attention to it, thinking as long as they don't come near me, we coexist just fine. As they got closer, I realized this person was wearing all black with a hood over their head. Normally, this wouldn't be anything special past the halfway point of my break, but what caught my attention was that this person had a very strange gait, almost as if they were floating on the ground. They showed no signs of breathing difficulty or tiredness in their legs. They moved robotically, with precision and execution that looked unnatural. I only had my awareness at half capacity because of my break, so I wasn't paying much attention. But as they got about 10 feet away, I tried to make small talk with them. They said nothing back, but their head turned slowly towards me. It took a few seconds for this whole exchange to happen, but when it did, this figure looked straight down at me, since I was sitting, and kept walking forward without missing a beat. I was horrified when I got a look at their face. It was like staring into the face of Emperor Palpatine, deformed and grey-looking. It was terrifying, and even their eyes looked unnatural. They just kept on going, and that is what really made me notice their movements. It all just looked so wrong. I pulled my head away for a second to grab my radio. When I looked back up, they were suddenly gone. I remember sitting there, thinking to myself, okay, there was no way they could have disappeared so fast. There's nowhere on or off the trail that they could go to fully conceal themselves, not like that. To make a long story short, I got the creeps and decided to get out of there. Originally, I was going to radio back about this person, but the whole thing was so weird that I could not shake it off. So. Now you're probably wondering why I am sharing this. Well, because two days after this happened, another ranger came up to me and told me about an experience he had while patrolling an area near where I was at. He also got weirded out by my story too, apparently. They found a dead deer on the side of the trails. When they approached the body, this deer had all of its organs and blood completely removed. The deer had not been cut open and there were no signs of flies or any decay, even though it had been dead for well over 12 hours. There were no bite marks, puncture wounds, or anything that would indicate it had been cut open in any way. 
It was as if somebody had killed this deer and just dumped it on the trail. Upon closer examination, they could not find the cause of death or how this deer died. It was as if it had suddenly fallen over and died, yet its eyes, tongue, heart, lungs, and other organs were all missing. There were also no tracks or any sign of a struggle when they found the deer. So, I guess the real reason I'm sharing this is that I want to know what you guys think about it. If any of you have had experiences like mine or have heard about weird things happening in the area, I would love to know. Thank you for reading my post, and feel free to discuss these events further. This happened not so late ago, maybe a few days. My name is Carl and I had this trip planned for three weeks. Me and my friends got on the meeting point and got in the car to finally start the trip we have always wanted. It was me, Josh, Carla, and Mark, and luckily they all made or to bring as much camping supplies for this, given that we believed it was better safe than sorry. It was a long two-hour drive until we reached our destination. I think it was called Marshland Campground or something. I didn't really pay much attention to the sign since I wasn't the one driving. After we reached a good location, we got our things unloaded and started setting up camp, first our tents and then some other things like parking the car on a better position and then gathering things for a campfire. As we finished and sat down to talk, a park ranger showed up from a nearby trail. He looked like your average park ranger, and with his grumpy voice spoke to us. Hey kiddos, I know you're all settled down to camp and all. But I do tell you that some places are off limits, Therese signs and all that crap saying it, so take my word and don't venture off. Of course, some pretty standard stuff, maybe some preservation areas where visitors were not allowed to camp or visit. After he walked away, we continued to chat like nothing happened. After a bit of talking we decided to hike on the trail and see if there was any place to visit like a souvenir shop or a local shop. As we went, we saw some parts that were boarded with tall metal frames and electric fences. Upon a closer look, there were signs like the ranger said, it read stay off, dangerous wildlife in the area. Along with symbols of different animals like wolves, foxes, spiders, bears, and something I couldn't make off, it looked like a quadrupedal animal of sorts that I didn't know about. Me and Josh joked about them keeping monsters hidden in the forest getting a laugh together. As the night fell early, it started to rain heavily, probably a storm, so we rushed into our tents, and since the group wasn't sleepy just yet we kept chatting through our phones since signal was still present. We heard some loud sounds outside and went to investigate, it was coming from far away from our camp, maybe a vehicle? We got our raincoats and flashlights, Josh also got us some hunting knives just in case, along with bear spray. We tried to locate the source of the sound and, as we hid in the bushes, we saw some staff opening a huge gate inside the prohibited area, as they sent animals like cows and pigs inside. Of course, this was already sketchy enough, but we couldn't exactly assume what they were doing, but the next thing we heard was the sound of said animals apparently running around, the sound of shock as a few of them ended up running to the electrical fence. We wanted to run away, but curiosity got the best of us as we stayed hidden to watch it all. We saw the light posts that illuminated the trail starting to flicker, and soon the place was dark save for the headlights of the truck. Lightning striked every so often, and we saw something move in the prohibited area, it was quadrupedal, had a muscular back and if I could guess was around the size of a large horse, but that's all we could see. Soon a deafening roar echoed around as the side of metal clanks started being heard. If that couldn't be worse, we also heard the staff screaming. We saw faintly one trying to get into the truck before being pulled back by something. It was an impossible to see, but definitively gruesome horror show. We saw a lit up flashlight illuminating in one direction, and that's when we saw it. Quadrupedal, a long body, probably 25 or more feet in length definitively carnivore, six eyes and two tails. What the hell is that thing? Was all I could think of upon seeing that beast, and its snout bloody with someone's arm still hanging in its mouth. 
Another lightning struck and we could see for a moment that it tore its way through the metal frames and fence. So the moment the light posts were off, it wasn't just a flicker. It was a full power outage and thus it could get through the electric fence without problems. We had to escape, we had knives but it probably wouldn't do anything to it, but there was no way we could escape given it was still around. Then, it saw us. We had no option but to run inside the prohibited area as it took some time to turn. We ran as fast as we could and not even seeing where we were headed to, we just wanted to escape. I faintly kept hearing its roars as it rushed through the foliage hunting us. Eventually we almost got to hide, almost, except for Mark, who tripped and we couldn't save him. We only kept running as it got hold of him and his screams echoed in our minds as we tried to hide in the foliage. We hid inside some large bushes, hoping it would not see us. After waiting for what felt like an eternity, we decided to get I and make our way to the car. As we were about to turn it on, we heard cackling sounds, and when we looked back, it was staring at us from outside. The moment we sped up it gave chase, somehow keeping up with the car, then it slammed itself into the car, causing us to spin over and crash it to the side of the road. Now we're in the worst situation, face to face with it, I don't even know what we could do other than hold my knife and pray it would go away. Then a small tremor was felt and it looked to the side, and a bigger one similar to it showed up, leading it away. The horror struck us upon realizing the horrible truth. It was a juveline. And it wasn't an individual, but a species. I don't really know how to start this. I was watching a YouTube video that made me think I should probably share my experience. This happened during my sophomore or junior year of high school, so almost three years ago. I live in rural western North Carolina, and I'm the first stop for the bus route. However, my bus stop is probably a quarter mile away from my house, as our neighborhood is on a hill with a big private drive that leads up to the houses. Every morning, around 6.50, I would walk out of my driveway and down to the bus stop and wait, it's pitch black down there, by the way, with only my phone flashlight to guide me. Every day, I would stand and wait, most of the time listening to music or just looking at my phone. It always felt eerie being in the dark alone like that, but I've always felt uncomfortable in the dark. One morning, as I was walking down the hill, it's a steep, long hill, by the way, I only made it about a quarter of the way down when I heard a scraping noise, almost like nails on sheet metal. Originally, I didn't think much of it and just slowed down a little. Then it happened again, all of this happened within 30 seconds, mind you, and by instinct, I stopped in my tracks. My heart started pounding from the noise, making me nervous, and I began to hear loud rustling at the tree line on my left side. Before I knew it, something pale, white, human-shaped, and maybe deer-sized ran out of the wood line into the small yard next to me. I turned and ran so fast I didn't get to look for long, as it triggered my fight or flight response. I ran all the way back up the hill, jumped over every step on my porch, and went straight into my house, truly fearing for my life and hyperventilating. Mind you, I'm a large guy, about 5 foot 11, 250 pounds. I don't get spooked easily, but I remember running and letting out a reflexive wail of fear. It's all I could do as I ran, and to this day, I never walk in my neighborhood in the dark. I was scared so badly that I found another way to get to school besides the bus and shortly after got my license. I just want to hear what you all think. I've only told my mom and my friends, and I'm more than willing to post pictures of where it happened as I still live here. I don't know what it is. I've lived in the same house for the last 18 years and it's only gotten worse. I live in an old coal mining town in Pennsylvania. I know my house is haunted, but I believe that to be beside the point. Something is stalking my family. The first encounter I had was in the early 2010s. I heard my name being called repeatedly from far away and it sounded like my friend. Started walking towards home and turned because I felt I was being watched. 
I saw a dark, humanoid figure that was at least 7 to 8 feet tall. I ran home. Things were fairly quiet as far as I can remember up until the last few years. Recently, things have been amping up. It started as rustling in the woods and the feeling of being watched. Next came the deer. So. Many. Deer. There was one I recall seeing multiple times in the same spot for a few days on my way home that just didn't look right. The most recent encounters has left me researching what to do. Two nights ago my mom saw a pale white face with glowing eyes pressed up against the front door. She said she froze in fear and didn't know what to do. Tonight I got home after dark and walked toward my house. Seconds after I locked my car I heard a blood-curdling scream come from the train tracks followed by a very calm voice yelling help me very loudly. I froze in fear for a solid 15 seconds just listening. I slowly walked up my porch steps just listening to two different voices screaming, one frantic and screeching while the other was calm and just called out help me. I yelled in the front door for my mom because the frantic voice sounded vaguely like my youngest sister, but I thought maybe she was messing around. When she came outside it grew quiet and the frantic voice had stopped. We heard help me one or two more times faintly than nothing. My sister was at a friend's house and it wasn't her. We went to pick up dinner and there were deer everywhere. Now, this isn't uncommon for PA to see a ton of deer, but like I said before, these ones were weird. They stared right at you and didn't run from the car, even if they were in the middle of the road. Someone please tell me WTF is going on. What are these things? I live in the Klamath Mountains in eastern Oregon, about 20 miles from the California border. Growing up I spent a lot of time outside camping, hunting, fishing, etc. A few months ago I had a strange experience on a family trip to our cabin near Crater Lake and wanted to see if anyone could help me maybe find more info on what I saw. I was by myself bird watching at a small pond in the woods maybe half a mile from the cabin in the late afternoon. I was sitting on a big log with binoculars. I wasn't in a blind or anything but I picked a spot where I thought I'd be less visible to any animals. After about an hour I hadn't seen much except a few common ducks and it didn't seem like many animals were very active so I was thinking about leaving. This was about an hour before sunset. Then I saw something move in the trees across the pond, probably a hundred feet away. It was just a flash between trees and I didn't really get any kind of look at it. But I kept watching the spot and after maybe 5 minutes saw something dart from one tree to another. It was bigger than most any local bird except maybe a heron and moved very fast, without making any noise, but I still didn't really know what I was looking at. This happened again a few minutes later, and then again a few minutes after that. Each time it was moving closer and closer to the pond. I don't think it knew I was there but it was staying incredibly well hidden, and only revealed itself for a split second at a time. At this point I'm thinking maybe it's a kit fox or a pine marten because of how fast and silently it moved. But I still hadn't got a good look at any part of it in detail. It moved between trees a few more times until it was behind a big dead tree right on the shore. I was staying as still and silent as possible but still worried it would see or more likely smell me and spook. But after a few more minutes I saw something move at the edge of the water. A little arm and hand that looked just like a human's reached out and touched the mud, and then the head and the other arm came into view as it leaned out to drink from the water. I could only see the head and shoulders and arms from where I was, but they looked so much like a person's. Except it was too small and covered in what I took as grayish-brown fur. The face wasn't exactly human, more monkey-like, but it was too far away to see much detail. I decided to try lifting my binoculars to get a closer look, but as soon as I moved it looked up and then disappeared back behind the tree again. I watched until it started to get dark, but I didn't see it again, not even darting behind the trees. I went back to the cabin and told my grandpa what I saw. He's been a rancher in this area his whole life. He said sounds like you ran into a hide behind and laughed. I said no grandpa seriously, this isn't a joke. 
He said he'd heard stories about Bigfoot and hide behinds and several times saw little human footprints on hunting trips deep in the mountains where no children would be. I think he believed me but he didn't really know anything. I asked my dad and brothers but they just started giving me shit about squatching lol. I went back to the pond the next day and walked around to where the creature had been, but I didn't find any tracks or scat or fur or anything. I did figure it had to be probably about three and a half or four feet tall based on the trees I'd seen it near, but narrow enough to hide completely behind a ponderosa pine. Which makes me think it must have been standing and moving upright. And that's it. I wish I'd seen more of it, but that face and hands were absolutely not like any local animal. It looked very much like a monkey or furry little human. I've tried to find more info but the only cryptid people seriously talk about in this area is Bigfoot. The hide behind seems like a joke. There may be little people or humanoids in some of the local Native Americans folklore but not a lot of detail I could find. I hope someone here has some ideas what I might have seen. It was a very unique and memorable experience and any further information would be appreciated very much. My step-grandfather had a very hard life. He grew up with his many many sibling being passed around through homes and orphanages. He would usually tell me a lot of funny stories because I was still young before he passed. But one story was different and I didn't remember it until just now, when I found out that this sub existed. I have no proof other than my word. One night, when he was 10 or so, he'd gone to bed at one of the orphanages he once stayed at. It was really late at night and he was having a hard time sleeping. But when he did fall asleep he had weird dreams where he made it sound like he was having an out-of-body experience. He was seeing himself sleeping in his bed that night like he was in the body of another person entirely. He described it like he was standing over himself, so I have to assume he was much taller. Then it all ends because he wakes up and opens his eyes. He said standing over him surrounding his bed, only the back end was touching the wall, were five or so really tall dark people. Dark as in shadowy. He couldn't see their faces at all. He said he didn't feel scared, and that he closed his eyes again. Then he said he fell asleep again and woke up in the morning. That was how he ended the story. No payoff. He never told the story to me again and he's been dead for a long time so there's no way to find out anything else. Based on vague memories of how he ended up telling me the story, I believe he was trying to say they were aliens. As a kid I remember saying that's awful at the end, because I think at the time I thought he was implying they had hurt him in a bad way. But looking back I don't think he meant it as a scary story. He was very quiet after. My step-grandfather was great. He was a father figure for me and I think I just wanted to share his story to honor him. I miss him a lot and I do want to take his word for it here. I don't remember him as a liar, especially when communicating with me. When I was young, I lived in the sticks in Vardaman, Mississippi. We had a cow pasture, and I would always go out there to play with my sister or cousins. However, when I was out there with only my dog, I felt as if I was being watched by someone, or something. I thought there was something out there, so I named it Thing. The grass out there was about 5 feet high, making it really hard to see anything, and I would hear the occasional whisper of Thing. The presence didn't seem threatening, it felt calm and collected, like it just wanted to watch me. Once, I caught a faint glimpse of it before it ducked down to avoid being seen. I would say it was about 6 feet tall, hairy, and resembled Bigfoot in a way. After a while, I moved away and never really thought about it again. But I think it is still back there. It was December 24, 1987. My family went to visit my great aunt in Wilmington, Delaware as we often did, for Christmas. Her husband had died in the house some 20 years earlier. After dinner my brother and I went to sleep in one of the upstairs bedrooms. I went to sleep on the left side of the bed which was closest to the door. 
My great aunt has a thing where she hated her doors to be shut and absolutely not to be locked so it was wide open as we drifted off. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sounds of something on the roof. I was seven and had just about given up my belief in Santa but it really sounded like footsteps. Could it be him? I tried to wake up my brother but to no avail. Shortly thereafter I turned to my left to see a figure just outside of the doorway. It was human shaped with its arms stretched towards the frame. It was completely black. I know someone was there because it was darker than the surrounding shadows cast in the hall. The only person in the house that was that large was my father. Supposing it was him I said dad? No response. At this this point I was starting to get scared and focused on its head to see its face. The only feature I could make out were two red points of light where the eyes should have been. It was then that I realized that I had messed up by speaking aloud and letting it know I was awake. I have rarely before or since felt such dread. I reached to my right to try and wake up my older brother. Again, no dice. I was alone with this thing three feet away from me. The only thing I could think to do was to pull the blanket over my head, pretend that I was sleeping, and hope to God that it hadn't heard me. Several minutes later I peered under the blankets and it was gone. About five years later I was riding to school with my brother and mom and I worked up enough nerve to tell them about it. I knew it could have been my imagination so I told them with an air of levity. When I was done they were silent for about two minutes. When I asked my mom what was wrong she turned towards me in the back seat and said we've seen him, too. When I was a kid, Probably in first or maybe second grade, I was sitting on the couch in our old trailer with my backpack on. It was a double wide, so I could easily look across through the wall opening to the dining room from the couch in the living room. This wasn't far away at all, given the small space. As I sat there, waiting for my mom to finish drying her hair, she had huge, fluffy hair because it was the 90s, lol, I looked up and directly in front of me, standing, or floating? Behind the dining room table, was this solid black figure. I looked at him, and he turned to look at me. We made eye contact, or at least something resembling it because his eyes were like two burning red holes. When our eyes met, time felt like it stopped, and I experienced the most complete terror I have ever felt, even to this day. Frankly, I've been through a statistically improbable number of really terrifying things, but nothing compares to that feeling. I was completely frozen, absolutely terrified. After what felt like an eternity within a moment, he turned and kind of floated out the end of the trailer. As soon as it ended and he was gone, I immediately jumped up and ran screaming to my mother. I told her what just happened, and she assured me that it was okay, that it was just my grandpa. I insisted to her that he absolutely was not my grandpa. We're from Appalachia, so ghosts and things like that are well accepted as real, although it is also understood that sometimes people make things up for the sake of a tall tale. Yes, ghosts are real, but one has to approach them with an attitude of discernment. Anyway, I still can't make sense of it at all. About a decade ago, in my early 20s, I found a story online about shadow men, with hats? And that really shook me up because it was the first time I encountered somebody talking about something similar to what I experienced. However, I haven't ever seen any accounts of this specific figure. The sheer terror I felt, completely consumed by fear, gives me an indication that whatever this thing was, it was not kind or good. Does anyone have any similar experiences? Back in 2021, a friend and I were splitting rent on a tiny farmhouse in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico while working. Anytime she was away from her room or out of the house, her door was open. One night, I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up hearing her call me from outside, saying that she needed help. She sounded absolutely terrified. I started to jump up and run to the back door, but something in my brain said to look at her door. It was firmly closed. I noped right to my bedroom, a grown-ass woman, and climbed into my bed, 
putting my covers over my head. The next morning, she said she had been in her room all night and had never heard a thing. I can't testify to the existence or non-existence of skinwalkers, but New Mexico made me believe in them. I never went outside late at night by myself again while we were there. Okay, so this happened earlier this year. My partner and I were coming back from delivering papers, which we always do late at night as we both work during the day. It was about 10 PM when we were walking back and saw a little girl who looked about 9 walking down the street. I thought it was weird, why would someone let their young kid walk around so late? I said to my partner that we should go see if she needed help. But then suddenly, it was no longer a little girl. It was a grown man. The little girl transformed into a man right in front of us. We decided to stay back behind him a bit until he was out of sight. That was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in my life. I had never experienced seeing shadow people until a few weeks ago. I woke up to see one walking into my bedroom closet before dissolving into the background. I've always been skeptical of the supernatural. I have a BS degree and follow a scientific way of thinking. I knew I had just woken up when I saw them, so I figured I was just hallucinating. Now, last night, I woke up and jumped up in my bed because I saw another one crossing the room to go into my closet. The difference this time is that my jumping up woke my cat next to me, who I saw tracking the movement of the shadow person. Am I in danger? Am I being haunted? I've been freaking out a little bit about this. About two months ago, my husband, 34 male, and I, 29 female, were staying in a camper on a friend's property in northern Wisconsin. One night, I wasn't feeling very well, so I went and laid down in the camper and promptly fell asleep. A few hours later, Around 3 a.m., I suddenly woke up and bolted out the door, starting to projectile vomit outside by the window. My husband called out and asked if I was okay. I managed to say, yeah, in between rounds. When I finally finished and felt like I was okay to go back and lay down, I spit a few more times to get rid of the taste, and as I looked up, there was a face about three feet in front of me in the darkness. I stared at it, and it at me. I was petrified, unable to move, but also afraid to take my eyes off of it. I slowly started to move my head up, down, and side to side to try and get a better angle or a closer look, and as I did so, it began to mimic my movements. There we were in the darkness of the forest, bobbing up, down, back, forth, slowly leaning closer and closer to one another as we tried to figure each other out. I stared straight into its cold, hollow eyes, unable to look away in fear of what would happen if I did. It stared back at me, almost as if it didn't know what I was either. It was too dark to make out any features, but the face had the shape of a human face. From what I could see on the body from behind the truck, it looked hunched over and distorted. We stayed that way for what felt like forever until I finally managed to call out, Babe. Yeah. My husband responded. There is something out here, I said, only slightly raising my voice. What? He asked. I don't know. Some kind of animal? I'm not sure, but I'm afraid to move. It's just watching me, I whispered almost to myself. He opened the door of the camper and looked out into the darkness. Where? He asked, unable to see what I was seeing. It's right in front of me, just watching. I told him, bewildered that he couldn't see it. He grabbed a flashlight and shined it in front of me, and it was gone. There was nothing there. I never saw it leave. I kept its cold, dead gaze the whole time. How could it not be there? I am still very confused by this interaction. I know it was there. I saw it. It wasn't a dream. And I know I wasn't hallucinating. Can anybody tell me what they think it was? Edit. Just to respond to a few comments. I don't drink, and I don't do drugs, so I was not inebriated. 
I don't remember all the details because I couldn't see very well, but here's what I got. I couldn't tell how tall it was because from what I could see, it looked hunched over and disfigured. I don't think it had any fur, it was pale in color, but again, it was dark, so I'm not sure what color it was. It had big black, soulless eyes, like looking straight into a void. It had sharp jagged teeth, and I don't remember a nose at all. I hope this description helps. Maybe it wasn't a skinwalker because I guess they don't leave Navajo land, but it was really scary. I should also mention that where I was in the woods of Wisconsin was not too far from the Hannibal Indian Reservation in Menominee County, Michigan, but again, not Navajo, so I'm not sure what it was. I'd like to preface this with the fact that I have no idea exactly who or what it was that I saw, but it's pretty spooky regardless of whether or not it has an earthly explanation and that's the part that continues to haunt me, 10 plus years later. I grew up in Sleepy Hollow, New York, home of the Headless Horseman, and allegedly a number of other hauntings. I was 16 at the time and riding shotgun in my then boyfriend's car, Headed home on old Sleepy Hollow Road at 3 a.m., this was before my parents enforced a curfew because I was taking advantage. At the end of old Sleepy Hollow Road is Sleepy Hollow Road, and a stop sign, at which making a left brings you through a densely wooded area to my parents' house. Old Sleepy Hollow Road is dark and curvy, and cuts through the woods that contain the old carriage trails which connect to the cemetery where the headless horseman is laid to rest and said to ride, as well as where some of the other legends of Sleepy Hollow originated. Not many cars frequent this road. Outside of tourist season, the village is quiet and the houses back there are quite sparse. This was the case even more so about 10 years ago. There weren't, and still aren't, many lights on these back roads, but there is one right next to the stop sign, almost like a spotlight. When we pulled up to the stop sign, I got such a fright because a young woman wearing nothing but a long white nightgown or otherwise thin white dress was very suddenly standing on the road right next to the stop sign. At first I was scared that we were going to hit her, but when we drove away the reality of the situation really started to sink in and that's when I felt extremely unsettled. What was she doing there at 3 am? It gave me a heavy pit in my stomach. This was around November in New York, it was quite frigid, and she had no jacket or any shoes on. There are houses back there, but not many. She didn't look directly at us at all, despite us almost hitting her, it almost seemed like she was staring straight through or beyond us. She was unblinking and unmoving. Very pale, with the cliché long dark hair to match. I remember asking my boyfriend if he just saw what I saw, and he just nodded. We never spoke about it again, until many years later when I confirmed with him that it really happened and wasn't just a figment or a dream or something. My parents live up against those woods, with my room on the bottom floor. I don't think I slept in my own room for months after that incident. I still think of it when I visit. I've read a lot about this figure and different accounts of it. There are stories of ladies in white across many cultures, but one thing that many of the tales have in common is the betrayal of a lover. This boyfriend was my first love, and unbeknownst to me at the time, he was secretly banging my best friend behind my back. To this day it remains one of the worst betrayals of my life. Eventually he became very violent towards me. I can't help but wonder if she was a warning of some sort? Of course, there are other related ghost stories in the immediate vicinity of where this occurred. Like the woman who froze to death at Raven Rock where she sought refuge during a harsh winter storm, a colonial woman who died hiding from a violent suitor, a Native American girl who was killed at the hands of her jealous lover, a teenager who died after being pushed out of her boyfriend's car during an argument. Hulda of Bohemia's homestead was in those woods, a quick 15-minute walk from my parents' house. I doubt it was her, by the way, but she has a very sad and incredible story associated with her for those who are interested, my fave Sleepy Hollow figure. Truthfully, the list of the many supposed apparitions of the area could go on for far longer. The happy ending I guess is that I dumped that loser and I grew up to work in the morgue. 
I definitely don't scare easily, and while I've had a few other unusual experiences throughout my life, this one is truly a mystery to me. I think of it every time I drive past that stop sign, and I sometimes still have dreams about it, as was the case last night, so I've resolved to get it all out and writing in an attempt to unload it to some internet strangers. Feel free to share your opinion or theories or similar stories, skeptic or not. For context, I am highly skeptical, but no stranger to the paranormal. I'm the type that believe demons exist, but most ghost stories are overreactions of easily explained phenomena or simply hoaxes. About three months ago I started working security for a hotel that was built back in the 1920s by a major hotel chain that has changed hands multiple times and is now owned by one of the biggest hotel chains. I'm not saying which so the company can't sue me. Now from what I've been told paranormal activity is not a common occurrence in the hotel, but some years back the Make-A-Wish Foundation started sending some children here because well it's a major resort at one of the most popular beaches on the east coast why wouldn't they? However the hotel was not informed of this and didn't realize what was happening until several children died in their rooms over the course of a few weeks. Supposedly on quiet nights you can hear children playing with a ball in the North Tower ballrooms at night. For years guests complained of children playing ball loudly next to their rooms even and when security would check there would be no one there. This has not happened in a while, but going into this story you should understand that my opinion on the cause of what I've seen may be warped by being told this story. Now every shift we do a floor check, especially on night shift when I work. At first I never noticed anything strange, I got a little creeped out by the quiet of the floors at night but nothing supernatural. The hotel has two separate towers separated by a restaurant and shopping area that connects them. About a month into the job and suddenly I started feeling like something was following me on my floor checks especially in the ST which is the biggest and tallest and where I understand most jumpers choose because all the rooms facing the ocean have sliding glass doors with a short railing in front and you can put the rest together from there. Anyway it got really bad in October, maybe the spooky season had an effect on me, but this feeling of being watched and followed never went away. As the weeks have gone on, I started seeing distorted faces in windows as I passed by to the point I no longer look at them. The floor pattern sometimes reflects on the glass and the mind could easily make a face with the pattern, but some of these faces were up further on the glass where this wouldn't have been possible. When I focus up there sometimes I can almost hear whispers in the back of my mind, urging me to unalive myself or lambasting me for the mistakes I've made or even telling me insecurities I have about myself I've never told anyone about. In the last few weeks some strange physical and auditory phenomena have occurred. Part of what we do on floor checks is close doors we find open, and some of the doors lately have been more difficult to close, one in particular I had to use all my strength to slam shut. The ice machines on each floor sometimes make a banging noise while in operation so I usually attribute any noise I hear from the vending area to that, but sometimes it almost has sounded like something was rummaging in the garbage cans and when I'd go to investigate I'd hold my keys so they wouldn't jingle in case it was a person, and as soon as I do the rummaging noise will stop. On a couple of occasions I've felt what I can only describe as hands touching me while closing certain doors sometimes just a tickle and other times a brush against the back of my hand and even a feeling like someone on the other side of the door is pulling it in the opposite direction against me. I now dread the floor checks especially after 3 am I'm not trying to make this seem scarier than it is, but these things intensify the closer it gets to that hour. Whatever they are they aren't friendly and I think they know I can sense them. They really don't like that I can sense them, like some nights that watched and followed feeling is more like a burning hatred directed towards my existence, like being stalked by an enemy or a predator. I'm pretty religious, and whenever. These things happen I always pray to God and when I do it usually goes away whatever it is. The scariest thing though is the last time it was that intense I heard something growl next to my ear. I've never been hurt by them so my assumption is they can't hurt anyone physically, but they try to communicate often and want their presence acknowledged. 
Almost as though that's where their power comes from. My grandmother told me once that demons truly have no power, they are only capable of whatever we believe them to be capable of. My mounting fear is feeding them whatever they are. My experiences could be just m seeing things or looking too much into something completely explainable I don't know this is just what I've seen and heard. Whatever it is hunting me at night my co-workers don't know about it, or at least they aren't telling anyone. I am bipolar, but medicated and I've never had hallucinations. Maybe I'm just crazy and seeing things, but if that's the case why am I not having any other signs of a manic episode or psychosis and why am I only seeing things in that one part of the building? Hi everyone. I wanted to share my experience with a fairy when I was a child. I'm currently 19, and all my life I've been obsessed with fairies. As a kid, I read books about them, researched them, and left offerings out to them in my backyard. And one time I saw one with no doubt. I was about 9 to 10 years old and I was at my cottage. This cottage is about 3 hours north of Toronto. The cottage has a huge forest in its backyard, and I was alone waiting at the top of the stairs leading into the forest. Suddenly, a tiny creature flew up to my face. I can't fully picture it, but I know it was mainly brown with long limbs and wings. It had a human-like face, and it made a motion with its hand saying come here or follow me and then it flew off towards the front of my cottage. I've had other smaller supernatural experiences at this cottage, but this one changed my life. Or solidified my belief in fairies, and even now, almost 10 years later I still doubt it. Let me know if you guys have any other similar experiences, and thank you for reading. I feel like something was trying to warn me. When I woke up, there was red writing all over the ceiling. It looked like computer programming code, but amongst this, there were glowing words in English. However, my brain almost couldn't register what it was saying, but all I felt was dread. I looked to the left of me and saw the entrance to this bridge that is in my city. It also felt like there were a few people standing around watching me, but I couldn't see them. After about 15 seconds or so, all of this disappeared. I knew I was awake the whole time. It wasn't just some weird dream, it at least felt extremely real. The reason I feel like it's a warning is because of two things. Recently, I connected with someone from a city that is on the other side of this bridge, whom I am due to meet. And later on next month, my cousin is getting married, also over the bridge. All morning, I have been trying to work out if it is just some paranoid hallucination or whether I should take this seriously. When I checked the time after, it was exactly 2 am, exactly 1 hour after I fell asleep at 1 am. I found it strange how it was exactly an hour after. I managed to get back to sleep after an hour or so, but I feel like I've got my guard up. I googled the entrance to the bridge, and it is exactly the same as what I saw. I've never been a spiritual person or anything like that, but this felt so real. I've never experienced anything remotely like this. So this happened years ago in about 2019. I was over at a friend's house. We had a good amount of people to play with their Ouija board, maybe five or so people. I want to preface this by mentioning the board we were using was used before to summon the well-known Ouija demon known as Zozo, by the person who owned the board. They supposedly sold their soul to Zozo for the demon to protect them from their biggest fear, which was being in a car crash or something similar to do with cars in that way. Anyways, we started playing. We circled the board with a planchette to warm the board up, and began asking questions. It began to answer responding yes to if there was a spirit with us, and answering basic questions such as its name, how old it was and why it died, which it gave answers to, I believe the first spirit had answered hospital. The group I was playing with began to ask dumb and all too playful questions and not taking it seriously, even making fun of me when I chastised them for not being serious about it, so I stopped playing with them after a while. I remember their non-serious nature went on for a while, 
But as they continued to ask questions, they all had gone silent and had seemed to become entranced by the board, deeply focusing and having a very very long session with it. I had tuned out mostly at this point, hanging out with my other friend on the couch who had also not opted into the session. This wasn't that I wasn't interested in playing, I just had no tolerance for the group not taking the game seriously, as I've always experienced paranormal shit since I was a baby in every single one of my households I had lived in prior, and was really sensitive to the paranormal. This was my first experience with the board, before I was followed by something. I asked to borrow the Ouija board, and my friend gave me permission. This marks the next time I played the board, which, this is going to be very dumb and cliché. But the day was Friday the 13th, and I decided on playing in Cal Anderson Park in Capitol Hill in Seattle, Washington. My friend and I took the board to the park, and I managed to find a few strangers to play with, my next mistake. We sat down and circled the board, I took to asking the questions. The spirit I managed to contact began to give me random letters, as opposed to the previous session having clear English written out. I asked if this was Latin. As I knew if the board began speaking Latin, you're supposed to end the session. It answered yes, then I asked if it was a negative spirit, it answered yes. Then I, my next mistake, asked IT permission if I could end the session. It told me no. Then began to circle the board in wide circles. I got really uncomfortable, and tried to push the planchette to goodbye, and a strong force pushed against the planchette not allowing me to pull it to goodbye. I did manage to push it to goodbye after some more force, and told the spirit it was not allowed to contact me again. I cut contact with the session, and flipped the board, believing the session was cut off, but left with a deep feeling of dread in my stomach, like something wasn't right. And that feeling was correct. My ex and I kept the board at his house in his shed for some time after that, because when we kept it in his house, Strange things would happen such as footsteps, doors closing and opening, knocks underneath the floor, his doorknob wiggling, and other happenings. We returned the board to the original owner after this, the one who had summoned Zozo with it, we didn't want it around anymore and the owner had wanted it back. After all of this, a spirit followed me home. I would hear footsteps running up and down my stairs outside of my bedroom. I would wake up freezing cold with a deep feeling of dread and a figure at the foot of my bed. One night there was heavy banging noises in the garage, which my parents blamed on me, to which I frantically responded see. Something isn't right, something did follow me home from the Ouija board, they began believing me more that night after the banging. I was so scared during this time that I sprinkled salt around my entire bed and doorframe, smudged with white sage, before I knew it was closed practice, slept with crosses and a Bible on my bedside table and prayed to God every night. I became extremely spiritual around this time because I honestly had no idea what else to do or where to turn. I just wanted the haunting to stop. One morning, my ex and I heard my mom knock on my bedroom door and ask us why are you guys sleeping still? And he got aggravated at my mom waking us up so early, I checked the time and it was 7 am which is really unlike my mom to be wondering why we were still sleeping at that time. When I went upstairs, a bit annoyed, to ask her about it, she was on FaceTime with my sister's kids in the living room, and had no idea what I was talking about, my mom isn't the type to prank me like that or lie, and she was really busy with the FaceTime call at the time it happened, I honestly think back and wonder if whatever asked us why we were sleeping was mimicking my mom or was an entirely different woman's voice and we had just chalked it up to being my mom since that's the only lady in the house. The thought still makes me sick honestly. The person who owned the board who summoned demons with it was also extremely troubled, and ended up unaliving himself a year or two after I stopped being friends with them. I haven't touched a Ouija board since, and the experience left me with some trauma. I still sleep with the lights on. I still did continue use with my pendulums, tarot cards, practiced with gems, and scrying. But I never touched a board again, and I never will. The concept interests me still, and the fact I did have such a profound experience I'm not sure if I'm morbidly lucky to have had, 
I'm just glad that thing that had followed me home stopped contact after some time. I recently came across your video from years ago about the invisible manta ray. I have had a similar experience in the past, but instead of being outside, it was inside my house. I saw it floating in a high corner, almost like a living creature. It seemed to be analyzing me, which really freaked me out. I tried not to look at it, hoping it would disappear, and eventually, it did. I've considered various explanations for what I saw, such as a creature that lives in the air, similar to those in the sea. I've even thought it could be a UFO or an angel. It was such a bizarre experience that I never bothered to look it up, but stumbling upon your posts has brought back those feelings of fear and fascination. I just wanted to share this with you. I just want to share a couple of my own fairy encounters that I 100% believe to be true and not my imagination. I'd love to hear if anyone has any other similar stories. In the first grade, I slept over at my friend's house. We had engaged in a lot of fairy hunting activities, more like trying to summon them. We made fairy houses, watched Tinker Bell, chanted, anything you could imagine. So, I wake up and check my surroundings to see if anything had changed since I had gone to bed. In my peripheral vision, I see a little figure more or less hovering above the ground, smaller than a finger. It was black and had wings. My shoe, with laces, was sitting on the ground, and the bedroom door was open. The figure flew out the door, but on its way out, it grabbed my shoelace and pulled my shoe onto its side and closer to the door. Unfortunately, my friend did not see it, and she still does not believe me because her sister had been the one responding to our fairy letters the whole time. But it would have been impossible for her sister to have done it. The second time I saw one, around fifth grade, it was a very similar experience. I was outside in the carport when, once again, I saw something in my peripheral vision, a small black figure hovering above the ground, flying very fast. I saw it go into some short shrubs, it was not windy, and I heard and saw it push the leaves out of its way. My sister was there, but once again, did not see it. Lastly, in high school, I dove back into fairies. I researched them and did all the things to try and interact with them again. I was outside during twilight with my friend, literally talking about them when we heard the most magical, peculiar sound, which, to us, sounded like it was coming from an old tree stump. Imagine if Maybell flowers, lily of the valley, could ring, and there were one thousands of them. That is what we heard, a soft and higher pitched sound. We both heard it. We went to investigate where it was coming from, and there were no birds or bugs that we could see. Neither of us had heard a sound like it before, nor have we heard one since. Honestly, hearing this sound is even more convincing than actually seeing them the times before. My brother and dad told me this story of their experience after they had gotten back from one of their snowmobiling trips. We live in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm not sure which mountain they went up to for their snowmobiling this night. They were riding their snowmobiles down a road with fresh snow, and it hadn't snowed for a couple of hours. As they were riding, they ended up encountering what appeared to be a perfectly built, brightly lit campfire, right in the middle of the road, in the middle of the dark. There were no footprints leading out on any side of the fire, no car tracks, and no sign of any human, just a picture-perfect campfire. There wasn't any way snow could have covered any signs of people being around, as I mentioned before, it hadn't snowed for a while. They didn't stick around to find out, though, as they were thoroughly creeped out and quickly continued on their way. I think about it frequently, they had no explanation for where the campfire had to have come from. Story time. A friend of mine went to Afghanistan and got stationed in an area that was used as a base by the Soviets. 
He swears that sometimes when he was on sentry duty he could hear whispers that didn't sound like English or the local languages. He's convinced he heard Russian. One time at an Air Force base in the ROK we had a power outage at night. All of us walked out of our hangar doors to take a see what the problem may have been and we saw a very, very large triangular shape passing over our hangar. It was a clear moonless night previously and when we went outside to look around we noticed the starscape being covered then slowly uncovered. No sound associated with the event other than normal sounds of the location. I'll never forget. Used to be F-22 avionics for the USAF, 2A 3x2, no shred, at an undisclosed base, a light appeared above the flight line moving in odd ways and hovering. We called it into our one and he called other AMS to ensure there were no sorties being flown that we didn't know about. Shortly after F-22s and 16s were scrambled and could not intercept the object. It disappeared into the night. We saw this go down from our flight line. Shortly after, we were informed that this never happened. My dad's stories. He served in the Taiwanese Marines as a drill sergeant. Much of the ground in Taiwan saw violence under occupation, and it was rumored his base was built on or near a mass grave. Needless to say he's had a few paranormal stories. He had a guy report to him in the morning exhausted but frazzled. The night before, he had been on guard duty, overlooking the firing range. The targets on the range were a mix of clay and wood figures, cut and drawn to look like an enemy soldier aiming a rifle at you. According to the guard, when he'd been bored out of his mind staring out over the range, he saw clear as day one of the clay soldiers wearily lay down his rifle and exclaim damn, I'm tired. The guard said he passed out from fright. During the evening, when training was over, the sergeants for the most part had the time to themselves. My dad liked to go snake hunting during dusk, when the heat was rising from the ground and the snakes came out of their holes. So one evening he sets out, carrying a bag, a nice long stick, and a flashlight. As he was making his way across the field, zigzagging in a search pattern, he found himself getting closer and closer to an old, decrepit outhouse that had been abandoned as it was too far from the main base. As he got within a few yards of it, he was hit with a sudden feeling of apprehension. Something told him going near the outhouse was a bad idea. At that moment, his flashlight, aimed right at the construct, went out. He fiddled with the battery, smacked it, thought better get a new battery, and turned around to head back. The moment he turned and faced the main base, the flashlight flickered back on. Great, time to keep hunting. The moment he turned to face the outhouse, it flickered off again. Face the base, it flickered on. He did this two or three times, got the message, verbally apologized for intruding, turned and walked calmly back to base. The base itself was surrounded by forest and mountains, the natural terrain of Taiwan. One day a soldier was reported missing, as the day went on, it was clear that he'd either deserted or was in serious trouble. A manhunt or rescue team was organized and most of the base was out searching for the guy as the rain started to come in. As night fell they called it off, and got ready to try again tomorrow. They found him in the morning, huddled in a wet, dark cave, scared speechless and out of his mind. No one was sure what he saw to cause him to freak out, and they never found out, they shipped the guy out soon afterwards. Finally, one of his years on the base, it was hit with a huge typhoon. Typhoons are pretty regular in Taiwan, especially during the summer, but this one was going to set records. Everyone hunkered down and reinforced the base as best they could, and it held well, and after days of relentless rain and wind, they emerged to survey the damage. One of the trees on base had been hundreds of years old, it sat on a hill and overlooked the base, and so had been the site of a Buddhist shrine set at its roots. Now the roots twisted and turned into the air, the storm had torn the tree from the ground. And yet, the shrine itself was untouched, even the red silk covering, with nothing weighing it down, hadn't moved an inch despite the winds that had finally torn the great tree from its hill after hundreds of years. The soldiers took this as a sign that despite whatever would be thrown against them, their spirit would remain strong and unmoved.
It's an old superstition amongst Navy SEALs that your last mission is the unluckiest. I believe it. When I reread the following excerpts from my journal it is evident. The completion of my most lucrative but bloodiest outing was uncanny. I have changed all the names. Most of you will refuse to believe my story. I know what happened, and I need to share my story. I was digging a grave. The Sierra Nevada mountain range stretched on for endless miles in front of me. Creosote and sagebrush scents dried my nose as a tall shadow appeared over the hole I dug. The unknown man had a gun in his left hand, but it was not pointed at me yet. Marine Corps Sergeant Lawson, the stranger said, I'm Navy SEAL Commander Joseph Card. Pleased to meet you. I dropped my shovel and squinted upwards. A special warfare insignia SEAL Trident pin glimmered on the lapel of Card's shirt. I wondered if I could disarm him. It was a tactical disadvantage that he was above ground while I was six feet under. There was no way of reversing roles in the fight, and I did not have intentions of making that ditch my place of burial. Not my name, I said. I resumed my work and tightened the grip on the handle and dug the end of the shovel into the earth. I know it is, he said. You're the only one with that ink job. The tattoo he had referred to was on my right bicep and it read Saint, a dead sinner revised and edited. If you'll excuse me, I said, I have more holes to dig. People around here have to bury their loved ones. Tomorrow's a busy day for the cemetery. I need your service. I know your kill count. You've helped this country. They used to call you the spreader of death. I threw the shovel into the wall of muck and looked up at him while wiping sweat off my forehead. I'm out of the service, I said. If I wanted to go on another mission I would have re-enlisted. This isn't for the government. I'm offering you a chance to do something good and make a fortune at the same time. Are you interested? No. You're wasting talent. You were born to save people and stop threats. This type of work is honorable, I said as I pointed at the shovel. It's practical. I don't kill, I honor the dead now. It's grueling, thankless and doesn't pay. Come with me. Time is finite. Card bent down and extended his hand to help out. No, I said. I grabbed the handle again and proceeded to dig. Card raised the gun. It was a tranquilizer device. I had seen the design before in Afghanistan. The barrel had a syringe spring out from the end of it along with a burst of brightness. A stinging sensation swelled on my neck. Dizziness overcame my vision as my eyelids grew heavy. I picked up the shovel and threw it at Card before he dodged it. You'll thank me in four hours, he said. Blackness covered the sky and swallowed my world. I woke up in a chair. Fatigue enveloped my body. My sight became clearer and I looked around. I was in front of a wooden table. Monochrome walls with expansive windows overlooked grassy plains. A wide theater-sized screen was at the end of the air-conditioned room. Card moved towards where I sat and handed me a jug of blue Gatorade. I nodded at him in, thanks, much too tired to show the malice I felt, and took a long gulp. Don't try to fight once you're hydrated, Card said. I didn't want to sedate you, but time is running out. Sit back and listen to the mission details. Remember, I'm trying to help you get rich. Where am I? Westover Hills, an older sounding man said. Texas. I stared in the direction of the echoing and unfamiliar voice. It originated from an individual in a suit and tie who sat at the end of the slab. A diamond studded watch was on his wrist and he had a mop of slicked back gray hair. There were four other men around the table. They wore casual dress shirts and pants. Their tattoos and demeanors gave them away as blue-collar veterans. I could tell some were also not brought there by choice. My name is Howard LaSalle, the man said as he stood up and walked near the forefront of the table. I know you've all had run-ins with Mr. Card, so I'll skip his introduction. The four of us looked at each other. The Howard LaSalle from Forbes? One of the grunts said. The billionaire Howard LaSalle? That's me. Pay attention to what Card has to say. Card cleared his throat while he stood in front of the screen, a remote control in his hand. Welcome, the SEAL said. Everyone, meet our newest guest, Keith Lawson. He's a valiant Marine Corps sergeant. He's been on special operations in Afghanistan. He was part of Enduring Freedom and other classified missions. I never took compliments well. I nodded at the group around the table. Also meet Josue Morales, 
an army ranger enlisted for many years. He hunted Noriega in the jungles of Panama as part of Operation Just Cause. Morales nodded. He looked younger than his actual age, but his stare reflected his time on the front lines. Meet Anthony Dryden, someone who's done work as a TF for years and has been a combat rescue officer in the Air Force. Dryden wore a black and white Jack Daniels ball cap. He pulled out a can of wintergreen tobacco chew and placed the dip in the side of his mouth. Meet Matthew Hain. Hain began his military career as an EOD. He became a member of DevGru. He has participated in acts of counter-terrorism. Hain had the look in his eyes of someone who wanted to get on with the details. Mr. LaSalle's daughter's kidnapped in Mexico, Card said. Her name is Victoria. She is a popular YouTube blogger. Vlogger, LaSalle said, with a V. Right, Card said. Her boyfriend Robert Lucas tagged along with her on their trip. Their goal was to film various locales down there. They were what the youth call urbex filmmakers. They were searching for an abandoned temple. According to lore, it is a place where the dead get rehydrated and fed to snakes thirsty for blood. It's known in legend as the Templo de Pucan. A place of ancient artifacts and dangerous creatures. I don't think it exists, but they did. During their search, they bribed tourist guides to try and get to it. They ran into some lethal people called Entre Los Scorpions. This translates to Among the Scorpions. They are one of the most vicious cartels in that region. This is their emblem. Card clicked a button on the device. The screen lit up behind him with an image of a gold ring resting on the back of a scorpion with a razor-sharp stinger. Card clicked the device again, and a picture of a woman holding an AK-47 came up. She had hair black as a well of ink. She wore a sand-colored bulletproof vest with another weapon slung over her shoulder. Their leader earned the nickname Devorador de Almas, the Soul Devourer, pictured here. Her real name is Alessia Bakkerin. We have confirmed Lucas is dead. They are threatening to end Victoria's life. They told Mr. LaSalle they would return his daughter for a price. They now want three billion dollars. I have a lot of money, LaSalle said while his eyes darkened, but not that amount. So, you all are the help chosen to retrieve her. I picked each one of you for a very specific purpose. I went down to Xochimilco alone before deciding a train team was necessary. I discovered film in a cave Lucas hidden before capture. Card turned around and began playing the found footage. Victoria and Robert laughed in the first scene. They walked down the lanes of Mercado Merced and Mercado Sonora. They went into street markets in Mexico between rows of flea shop stands. They went into an occult bazaar with mason jars, voodoo dolls, spirit boards and candles. A man wearing robes and rings on every finger gazed up at them as they entered. Where can we find the Templo de Pucan? Robert asked. The shaman gave them directions to an outer borough of Mexico City. The two took a riverboat. The famous island of dolls were there. The miniature mannequins hung in the trees. Their burnt plastic bodies were beneath a wooden sign. Spray-painted words designated the area as off-limits. A jump cut in the film occurred. They stood at the mouth of a cave. A scream erupted. It was victorious. A gun's muzzle showed up on the right-hand side of the camera view, and a black-gloved hand wrapped around Robert's throat. The camera fell to the ground and the screen went black. Card clicked again. A photograph of a large mansion made of clay surrounded by fertile green land came up. This is our target, Card said. We infiltrate, take out any threats, and question for more info. Bakarin's group resides here when they're not taking hostages or invading villages. Someone inside knows Victoria's location. We can be there by tomorrow. Let's eat, drink, and rest tonight. We save her life after sunup. Two million dollars each if you bring Victoria back alive, LaSalle said. The chopper you'll be traveling in has anti-radar. A picture of Victoria LaSalle came up on the screen. She was 22 years old. I looked at the image of the young woman. I thought of her callow worldview. Her inherent trust of people and the online gold rush of fame led to her kidnapping. I still believe that the situation she was in was undeserving. Despite how much I disliked the way Card drafted me, I felt I still had to help. If it was only in remembrance of the girl's spirit by exacting revenge, 
It would be worth it. We leave tomorrow morning, Card said. Your lodging for the night is down the hall. What kind of gear are we getting? Morales asked. You'll see. We left the boardroom. I know the Devor door to Almos, Morales said. We walked down a hallway with windows which overlooked a golf course. Morales looked straight ahead. His eyes seemed to peer on into forever before he continued. She has killed some of my family. I can't wait to squeeze life out of her. Stepping onto the four-bladed, navy-style Black Hawk chopper made me feel at home. It sat on a black and yellow painted helipad built onto a piece of land owned by LaSalle. The smell of sweat and exhaust bombarded us when we went into the chopper. The pilot ignored us and focused on the controls of the dashboard. My boots landed on the floor's ringlets and pipes locked for stretchers and extra seats. I buckled up. The open back cargo area held our weaponry. We were all carrying USB-45 tactical handguns with threaded barrels and suppressors. Our primary weapon of choice was the M14 SOCOM or AK-47Ts. In the incident of a firefight, we would be able to reload by stripping the combatants' bodies of ammunition. It was the same as what the cartel carried. Our body armor was class 3 of plates made of carbon fiber. Bow fang radios were on our belts alongside our holsters. We carried four grenades each. I had a World War II era K-bar. Some of the others carried SOG seal pub blades and benchmade knives. In the back of the chopper were six old Soviet rocket-propelled grenade launchers. There were also mounts, multi-tools, and attachable advanced optical combat gun sights, a COGS. I donned bracers which kept my blades secure and within easy reach beneath the long sleeves of my top. It took less than a minute for the Black Hawk to enter the air. The planes below were specks. The houses resembled motionless ants. Some of us were still assembling our guns as we drifted in the atmosphere. We are going to scout the mansion, Card said. We do recon after stalking the premises. If we find the target, we take her in for questioning. Remember how this is a rescue mission. We neutralize threats only when left with no other choice. I looked over at Morales. He pulled out a key chain and stared at it. It had a scorpion frozen in a block of amber attached to the metal pieces. I kept my head down as we passed the outlines of cathedrals, colleges, and museums in Mexico City. Their earthen-tinged buildings reflected the clouds and sunlight. There were estates the size of city blocks surrounded by gates below. We kept ourselves fed with protein bars and water as we neared a stretch of land filled with rivers. The landscape resembled a labyrinth of cracked dirt a child had spilled a bucket of water over. The Black Hawk landed on a hillside facing a field of legumes and different varieties of grass. Cart ordered us off, and we began running along the mound. We marched for half a mile before the mansion came into view. Elevated walls with marble slats formed a canopy above a terrace and swimming pool. Black framed windows and roof gardens held verdant plant life. Gapola shrubberies lined the outskirts of two different courtyards. One was in the front and back. Both had white and pink tiles which looked as though they had been dug out from a holy structure and brought there. Beige beams and silver railings encircled a dark wooden spiral staircase. This was visible from where we were because of the absence of glass. A statue stood next to the swimming pool. It looked like Lady Justice. Instead of scales she held a snake in one hand and a severed head in the other. Do you know what that statue is? I asked Morales. The dope god Ola Kuhn, he said. She is always carried by the cartel. Get down, Card said. We laid flat on our stomachs and took cover behind a row of bushes. We peered through the sights of our sniper rifles. Card pulled out a pair of infrared binoculars. Lots of scorpions there, he said. Remember, the less engagement the better. We'll wait here all night for Alessia if we have to. I looked out at the rear courtyard. Two men walked. One was a scorpion. His uniform was normal for the group. He had on beige khakis, a tactical overcoat and an AK-47. He was pointing his weapon at the second man, who was in his 70s. The old man's hands were behind his back as the scorpion prodded him along. He kicked the hostage in the back of the knees. The elder dropped, and the scorpion aimed the rifle at his head. The scorpion hit the old man with the butt of the weapon and made him squirm. 
I aimed at the scorpion's kill zone. I squeezed the trigger. A crimson trail floated from the hostel as he fell to the ground. Shouting flared up. Seven scorpions flooded out of the estate. Dryden picked off two of them in a matter of seconds as I shot another. Circle the perimeter, Card yelled. Morales, stay on Lawson 6 and take the right. Dryden, take the front courtyard and stick with Hain. I'll get around to the back and start clearing the house. We don't want them calling reinforcements. We sprinted towards the mansion. A member fired shots at us as we took cover behind a marble block behind potted plants. Bullets chewed through the stone as I returned fire. Morales unsheathed his sog blade, stood up when the fire had ceased, and threw it. The knife landed in the enemy's eyes. His body tumbled back as he continued to unleash a spray of lead everywhere. The back of his skull cracked open with the impact of the fall. Advance, Morales shouted. We moved further up to an overhang supported by clay beams. A member fired shots at us from the inside. Morales was thrust backwards in the air. I squeezed the trigger at the opening. I whipped around and scanned the area for advancing movements. Are you okay? I asked. I'm fine, Morales said while standing up. The bullet must have hurt, but his vest protected him. We trailed along the western side of the house. We glanced around the corner to see Hain evade a chucked Molotov before it burst. Hain shot the man who had tried to kill him. The smell of fuel was pungent in the air as his combatant's lifeless form buckled. Hain kicked in the door and entered the place. We followed behind him, our guns at the ready. The main foyer had a large spiral staircase and an open area which resembled a hotel lobby. Three waited for us. Hain's armor got hit as he executed the first attacker. Morales took out the secondary. The third unloaded a round at us as I shot him in the arm. His gun dropped and he fell to the tile. He unsheathed the hatchet, stood up and ran towards me with a wail. I gave him two rounds to the neck before he went limp and face planted. Card's voice rang out. Grenade. We went to the ground and covered our ears. An explosion rocked the eastern side of the mansion. Debris showered us. We concealed our faces from the cloud of destruction as best we could. Card came down from the blitz staircase, dragging two bodies with him. He threw them down to our level as he leapt over the railing. Dust and gore blanketed him. Take what they have and reload, he said. It's clear from the bottom up. We have the basement left to search. Go. Our commander pointed at an oak wooden door swung open in the far left corner. I was in the front of the group. I turned on the flashlight attached to my scope. I descended a rickety old staircase to the subterranean part of the narco mansion. Card was closest to my side with the others following. We entered a Baroque-style wine cellar. Copper plates hung on the walls. Shelves with carved drawings on their oak held long rows of bottles. A scorpion jumped out from behind a wood barrel. I grabbed his arm and broke his wrist and slammed my hand into his solar plexus. He doubled over and I gave him a knee to the face. I grabbed the back of his head, swept his feet out from under him and placed him in a rear naked choke. Card tapped me on the shoulder. Don't kill him, he said. Let him go. He might have some answers we need. He's the only one left alive. I released him and stood up. Card had Morales translate his questions into Spanish. Where is the soul devourer? Where is Victoria LaSalle? The scorpion spat on Card. Card pulled out his handgun and shot the man in the left knee. Tell him that he'll be wheelchair bound for the rest of his life unless he starts talking, Card said to Morales. The man began crying as Morales repeated the words. He says that there is a map leading to where they are, Morales said. The Templo de Pucan. It's in the head of the Ola Kuhn statue near the pool. Retrieve it, Card said after facing me. Dryden, you go with him. I went up the basement steps and out towards the pool. I passed piles of bodies. At least 20 scorpions lay dead. A fire was burning the ground on the other side of the mansion from the throne Molotov. The old man who was a former hostage of the first scorpion I shot at was lying down, bleeding but alive. I cut the restraints binding his wrists. I gave him an MRE and advised him to go home. He thanked me and went into the desert. I approached the Olokun statue. I drove my K-bar into the head she held. I slipped my black gloves on. 
I dug my fingers into the hollow interior and pulled out a thick piece of brown parchment covered in grime. Morales stared at the map after Card grabbed it. He unfolded it on the surface of a table in the cellar. We let the scorpion go after Dryden administered aid to him in the form of a tourniquet. We gave him a fractured beam to use as a walking stick. I helped him up the stairs and brought him to the edge of the property. We made sure he did not have a cell phone or radio. I wished him good luck as he hobbled away. I knew the environment, coupled with the severity of his injuries, was going to take his life. This does point to the Templo de Pucan, Morales said. That can't be right. The temple is a myth. It's a place destroyed during a war between rival Mayan kingdoms in the 5th century. We're about to see if it's real or not, I said. I reloaded my AK-47. We sat in the back of the Black Hawk, flying through the air in a direction using the map's coordinates. Morales took off his vest and revealed bruising around his ribs. I gave him my vest since his got damaged. I went into the back and retrieved a new one. Your tattoo, Morales said. Who wrote it? Ambrose Bierce, I said. It's the definition of a saint from his book The Devil's Dictionary. What does it do for you? It reminds me how nobody's perfect. Keeps me from self-loathing. Thanks for what you did back there, Morales said. What you did back there was hot-headed, Card said. Good job to the rest of the team for dealing with the jarhead's mistake. I took the criticism, aware the firefight started with me trying to do the fair thing in saving an old man's life. Straight on, the pilot shouted. We stared. It can't be. Morales said. A moss-covered pyramid made of old stones came into view on the horizon. It was the ancient building seen in countless historic drawings. I thought of human sacrifices painted blue and brought to the top. My mind could not escape the image of their hearts eaten by a predatory god. The sun lowered. The black hawk landed on a neighboring hill covered in grass. We jumped out and took position on a precipice. We crouched and stared through our sights and night vision binoculars. Oh my god, Dryden said as he squinted through his acog. Are you seeing this? There was a campfire, tents, and bodies in the distance. The corpses looked starved. They in rows, as if they were about to be burnt or buried. They all wore the scorpion uniform. A figure walked past them. I recognized her. I found Alessia, I said. We take her alive, Card said as he pulled out the same tranquilizer gun he had used on me a day and a half ago. She knows where Victoria is. Is anyone else with her? The dead. Dryden said. We're heading in, Card said. Maintain concealment. We approached the pyramid. The sounds of rattling snakes and the smell of rotting flesh wafted towards us with each step. We crouched low in the bushes within fifteen feet of the soul devourer. A hatchet flew by my head. A net wrapped around my body. Card pulled out his gun and fired. A masked scorpion ran near me, and while I wanted to shoot, the net constricted my body and I could not lift my weapon. He hit me upside the head with the butt of his AK. I lost consciousness. I woke up. Everything came into focus like an image in a microscope. I heard arguing in Spanish. Looking over with my wrists tied in vines, I saw Morales hung upside down from a palm tree. Right by his side were Dryden and Card bound in the same way. Most of our gear was gone. I felt my knives were still intact, but there was no way of using them. Alessia smiled at us as a campfire's flames roared behind her. Next to Alessia was a folded-out briefcase lined with hacksaws, rods, pliers and needles. Where is Victoria? I yelled at her. The soul devourer laughed and walked towards me. She reached out and grabbed my jaw. She leaned in close enough to kiss me. They're inside, she said, pointing to the mouth of the pyramid. See all those bodies? She gestured to the men drained of blood. Alessia pulled what looked like the front of a human skull, with two bands near the back. It resembled a Dio de los Murdos fashion item. Leathery snake skin wrapped around the bone matter. Victoria's lover is the one responsible for this, Alessia said. We didn't kill him for sport, we did it for vengeance. Do you even know what the Pukins are, gringo? Shapeshifters. Creatures able to take different forms. The boy wandered around the temple one night when we fell asleep after he tried to escape. He found the mask, one we knew as sacred, but his ignorance cost him and us everything. 
He decided to put it on and he resurrected them. Victoria is about to become a feast for the Pukins. My men were as well after her foolish boyfriend fell victim to his own curiosity. You are soon to be, also, Ares Unipera Tonta, Morales said. Pinche Pero, she said after walking towards him. You'll be the first one I torture. Morales brought his hands down. A knife slid from one of his bracers. He cut the vines which imprisoned him. He dug the knife into Alessia's forehead. She slumped to the earth. He bent upwards and cut the bindings on his feet before landing on his back. The same guard who had knocked me out unleashed a spurt of bullets at the escaped ranger, who pivoted to the side. Morales grabbed a Beretta off Alessia's belt and ended the scorpion's life with a shot to the chest. He cut the rest of his team members down from the bindings. Card had a black eye, Dryden had a scrape on his forehead, and Hain looked exhausted. We retrieved our gear from their tents and put on our combat attire again. You heard her, Card said as he motioned to the mouth of the pyramid. Victoria's in there. Let's go. What about the pukins? Dryden asked. You know, the shapeshifters brought back to life? You believe in old wives' tales? Card asked. Olesia was trying to scare us. Dryden stared at the seal. I don't see how these men could have had blood removed from their bodies, sir. It doesn't add up. Not our problem, Card said. Focus on the goal at hand. We've all seen worse and you know it. Let's go in. Dryden nodded, and we went into the temple. There was a long corridor with a floor made of stone blocks. The first few walls were heaps of ancient mortar. Once we were in a larger area with hung torches which lit the way, we walked on hollow ground. The Mayan interior had stucco friezes. Depictions of human figures lined the barriers. They had elaborate bird headdresses, jade jewels, and each one sat cross-legged. Ceramic vessels were on the shelves against the walls. Glyphs of goddesses with snake heads and other deified rulers of an age long gone greeted us. We went into another chamber. A wooden funerary mask with emerald beaded teeth hung in the center and gazed down at us in warning. In the next hall, there were holes in the ceiling. Fluorescence from the moon and stars pierced through them as beams. Obelisks lined up like an Aztec Stonehenge. Victoria was in the middle of the room. She wore a white top and black cargo pants given to her by the cartel caked in blood. She was staring at the ceiling and looked at me as I approached. She was bound to one of the pillars. I cut the ropes. Your father sent us to save you, Card said. They, she said. Who's they? Morales asked. They're coming for us. The sound of hissing filled the room. Something moved to my left. When I turned with my gun aimed, I saw Dryden lifted off his feet and carried towards the ceiling. His form floated through the beams of light. He screamed, released a few shots, and vanished. The remaining four of us pointed our guns up. Dryden fell back down to the ground. He was pale, thin, and devoid of blood, like the men who were out front. His breathing had ceased. The thing swooped down. It was a serpent the size of a battering ram used to tear down doors on medieval castles. Two black leather wings outstretched on either side. The wings had sharp tips laced through it like sticks used to hold a kite together. Card pulled out his knife and slashed at the monster. The stringy and fibrous gliding implements tore. Blood spurted from it onto his clothes. Hain came up from behind and tried to climb onto its back, but its body was too slick. I ran up to Hain. I climbed onto his shoulders and leapt onto the creature's back. I yelled out a battle cry and emptied a clip into the pukin's head after pointing the gun straight down. It fell forward like a slinky. I landed on my side and slid from its flesh. Card grabbed Victoria's hand, and ran towards the entranceway after motioning for us to do the same. We followed at a sprint. One of the beasts slithered out of the shadows as fast as a vehicle going full speed. Its body writhed with serpentine movements towards us. Its wings folded onto its form with tightening muscles. Its body locked up to spring at us as grotesque noises echoed in the chamber. Card pulled the pin on his grenade and threw it into the creature's mouth. It exploded in a cloud of entrails as we continued running. Another pukin followed behind it. As the third one neared us, it began to change its own form, mutating. I was not eager to find out what shape it would take next. I lobbed a grenade behind me as we went outside. 
The creature's head made it to the threshold of the mouth of the pyramid. Morales turned around and began shooting at the eyes. The creature's tongue lashed out and hit him in the knees, and its gaze burrowed into him. Morales' gun dropped as his body froze and began seeping out blood in front of me. The red fluid soaked into the earth and gushed towards the fangs of the monster. I lobbed more grenades until my belt was empty. I reached for Morales' belt and retrieved his key chain and another bomb. I threw it at the pukin. We ran over the row of dead scorpions. Victoria tripped over Olesia's body. I helped pick her up, and we continued to run. The base of the pyramid was the first to get wiped out by the blasts. The rest fell as if a hurricane had wreaked havoc. The stones tumbled down onto the creature's body, halting its advance. Morales got buried with it in a maelstrom of fragmented rock. We ran up the hill and jumped into the Black Hawk. It was two minutes before Victoria was secure in a chair and we lifted off the ground. As we ascended, I looked down and saw more slithering forms. I wished I could go back and retrieve Morales and Dryden to give them the proper burials they deserved. I grabbed an RPG from the back, leveled it, took in a deep breath and fired a missile at both of the snakes. The targets evaporated in flames. The palm trees, bodies and blocks of granite became engulfed in an inferno below. The blaze and debris rose as an angry storm before it all collapsed back down. The mission was successful, Card said. We did it. Good job, men. We remained silent for hours after as the desert landscape passed beneath us. The keychain Morales had kept stared back at me. The scorpion frozen in amber. I decided to pocket it as a keepsake, a remembrance of the man who served by my side. We were soon over the border and back into the United States. My dad sent you? Victoria asked. We all nodded. Alessia told me my father's been funding money for rival cartels in this region, Victoria said. She stared out at the night sky before she continued, he's involved in arms deals down here for terrible people. He always told me his money came from oil. He lied. They didn't take me hostage with the hopes of making money, they did it to torment him. None of us said a word. Victoria reached into one of the side pockets of her cargo pants and pulled out the Mayan skull mask. The very object which had caused the rift between what we recognized as real and the unknown. The item which had allowed those beasts to escape from their world of sleep, their nests. This made me feel alive when I was wearing it, Victoria said. It made Lucas feel amazing, too. It brings out a sense of godliness. Have the three of you ever felt anything like that? I pulled out my .45 and shot the mask. A fog filled the inside of the chopper, emanating from the remaining pieces which rained down on us. I kicked what landed on the ground out of the compartment to the nether sands. Howard LaSalle's mansion came into view as Victoria screamed at us. And. I worked in Arlington National Cemetery while I was in the army. The tomb guards always talked about seeing or just hearing soldiers marching some nights. We were cataloging graves one night when I thought I saw a soldier in my team up ahead, so I called him over. He answered from behind me. When I looked back, the other soldier was gone. I am a skeptic and I believe everything paranormal has a real-world explanation, but I'm still trying to figure that one out. Former USCG here. Saw a ghost and some creepy shit happen when we were removing the old Fresnel lens from the Prescott light in Michigan. Also, seen some weird creepy lights in St. Elmo's fire near the old Wagashans light. Compasses and radios all quit, radar and GPS wouldn't work either. The light near Sturgeon Bay is haunted as well, and we stayed at the light near two rivers, and the whole family saw the ghost. There are several lights in the Great Lakes that are open to active, reserve, and retired military members as vacation rentals. We stayed at Raleigh Point Lighthouse and the Sherwood Point Lighthouse. They have visitors' logs that are like a diary, and multiple stories are in there about the hauntings, dating back to the 70s. I know that Sherwood Point is haunted. When I was in Groton CT, for basic enlisted submarine school, I was roving the barracks at night. I had AUI, 
under instruction, so I was showing him the ropes, what to check and, and how to check. It was mainly fire extinguishers and secured doors. Well on the second or third floor of the barracks there is a recreation room with a TV and chairs and a piano. Mind you everyone was asleep and it was two in the morning. Well I decided to go and see if I remembered how to play the piano a little. We decided to continue to finish the patrol so we started walking down the hall when we heard a single piano note go off. We both heard it while I was in mid-conversation so we kind of looked back, and then we both looked at each other to see if we both had heard the same noise. We shrugged it off as our imaginations running wild. But as soon as we got to the end of the hall and opened the door to the stairway a sharp key note was heard coming from down the hall in the direction of the room with a piano. We left the floor as soon as possible and later shared the story with some shipmates and they told us stories of sailors that had died in the barracks. The rain drizzled down in a haunting rhythm as I navigated the unfamiliar streets of an upper-class neighborhood, the kind where mansions lined the roads like silent sentinels guarding their secrets. My quest for a reliable used car had led me to a Craigslist ad promising a well-maintained older sedan, the type I preferred. The address pointed me toward a mansion that exuded opulence. It seemed out of place for a simple car transaction, but I dismissed the thought, attributing it to the eccentricities of the wealthy. The seller, a middle-aged man with a bland smile, greeted me at the door. We exchanged pleasantries, and he led me to the garage where the sedan stood, waiting to be scrutinized. As I examined the car, my suspicions grew. It was in pristine condition, almost too good to be true. Despite my reservations, I decided to go ahead with the inspection. However, my gut feeling intensified when the seller casually mentioned that another interested party would be arriving shortly. I felt a twinge of annoyance but chose to wait patiently. The minutes stretched like eternity, and the sound of rain tapping against the garage roof became a maddening drumbeat. Finally, after 45 minutes of relentless waiting, I decided enough was enough. I approached the cellar, frustration etched across my face. Look, I've been waiting here for almost an hour. If you have another interested buyer, I'll leave. I won't play this waiting game any longer. The seller offered a half-hearted apology, assuring me that the other party was on their way. My patience worn thin, I decided to make my exit. Before leaving, however, I couldn't resist sharing my discontent. I leaned in and whispered, you know, I was planning on paying close to your asking price in cash. But after this wait, I'm not so sure anymore. And, by the way, I just told the other guy all the known issues with the car, the head gasket problems, the whole deal. Figured he should know what he's getting into. The seller shot me a venomous glare, a mix of anger and frustration. I felt a twisted sense of satisfaction knowing that I had just turned the tables on a man who had tried to manipulate the situation for his benefit. As I walked away, the rain intensified, mirroring the storm of emotions swirling inside me. I detested greed and those who preyed on the vulnerability of others. Little did I know, my actions would set in motion a series of events that would lead me into the depths of a chilling and unforeseen nightmare. Days later, as I drove my trusty old sedan, I noticed a shadowy figure in my rearview mirror. A cold shiver ran down my spine as I realized it was the seller's son of a bitch look-alike, tailing me with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. Paranoia crept in, and every turn I took, every stoplight I encountered, the figure remained relentless in its pursuit. I tried to shake off the unease, convincing myself it was just a coincidence. But the feeling persisted, growing more ominous with each passing day. Late one night, as I parked my car in front of my apartment, a chill wind whispered through the air, carrying with it an eerie presence that sent a shudder through my soul. The next morning, I discovered a cryptic message scrawled on my windshield, greed has its price. Panic set in as I realized the handwriting matched that of the seller. The knowledge that I had angered someone capable of such malevolence filled me with dread. From that point on, my life unraveled in a series of inexplicable events. Strange noises echoed through my apartment at night, and shadowy figures lurked in the corners of my vision. The sedan I had purchased, once a symbol of my triumph over greed, now seemed to carry a curse that clung to me like a relentless specter. 
sleep became a distant memory as nightmares invaded my every moment. The line between reality and terror blurred, and the walls of my apartment seemed to close in, suffocating me with the weight of my own paranoia. In a desperate attempt to break free from the sinister grip that had entangled my life, I decided to part ways with the cursed sedan. As I handed the keys to the new owner, a sense of relief washed over me. Little did I know, however, that the horrors unleashed by that fateful Craigslist encounter were far from over. The following nights became a descent into madness. Unseen hands seemed to reach out from the shadows, and whispers echoed through the darkness, accusing me of my own sins. The line between illusion and reality blurred, and the spectral figure of the seller haunted my every waking moment. In a final act of desperation, I sought the help of a paranormal investigator, hoping to rid myself of the malevolent force that had taken root in my life. As we delved into the supernatural realm, the truth unfolded, a curse, born from greed and manipulation, had latched onto me, seeking to extract a price for my defiance. The investigator performed rituals, incantations, and cleansings, but the malevolent force only grew stronger. The sinister whispers intensified, accusing me of betrayal and greed. The shadows, once confined to the corners, now stretched like tendrils, threatening to engulf me in an eternal night. In a desperate bid for salvation, I returned to the mansion where it all began. The rain poured down, a torrential downpour that mirrored the storm within. As I stood in the abandoned garage, the echoes of my confrontation with the cellar reverberated through the empty space. A ghastly figure materialized before me, the distorted visage of the cellar, his eyes filled with malice. You thought you could escape the consequences of your actions? He hissed, his voice a chilling echo. The air grew icy cold as the curse tightened its grip, the shadows closing in. In that moment, I realized the true horror of my folly. The curse was not confined to the car or the seller's vendetta, it was a manifestation of my own guilt, a relentless specter born from the darkness within. As the shadows enveloped me, I felt a searing pain, not physical but metaphysical, a reckoning for the sins that had brought me to this cursed crossroads. The rain continued to pour, washing away the remnants of my existence, leaving behind only the haunting whispers of a cautionary tale, a tale of greed, manipulation, and the chilling price one pays for crossing the thin line between desire and damnation. My family and I needed a break, so we had to leave the city because it was very stressful. Both my husband and I had full-time jobs, he worked in an office, and I worked at a nursery. Even though I loved working with children, it could be tough sometimes dealing with more than 30 noisy four-year-olds. It could be a nightmare instead of a dream. Last month, we were searching on Craigslist to find a vacation home. Please don't laugh, but sadly, we didn't have a big budget and couldn't afford an expensive luxury hotel trip. Looking back, using Craigslist wasn't the smartest choice. We probably should have used Airbnb, which is safer and has some rules for people who rent out their homes. But on Craigslist, there were many options. So, I started looking at the holiday homes and rentals. We wanted to go far away from the city, preferably to the countryside near farms. The rent was quite reasonable because, well, what was there to see in the countryside? Mostly cows, grass, and trees. Not many people were interested in that. My kids were always on their smartphones, so that's another reason we chose rural areas. In the end, we booked a place, a nice little cottage with a few extra buildings on the edge of a big farm. The man who was renting it said he owned the whole farm, and he wanted $100 a night for us to stay in the cottage. That seemed okay because we also got our own small garden with a fence and some other cool stuff. I contacted the owner and told him I wanted to give him some money as a security deposit. He agreed, and I did that in just a few seconds. Now let's skip the difficult part of getting my family ready. I only had two kids, or three if you count my husband. Getting everyone ready was a big challenge, so I won't go into all the details of that. Just think about it, five hours of arguments, kicking, screaming, and tantrums in the car on the way there. The trip itself took a couple of hours, which wasn't too bad. When we finally arrived, I was pleasantly surprised by how nice the whole place looked. Well, 
That was until I got to the main part of the farm. At first, the entrance of the estate had shiny new metal gates, and there were also a couple of statues on both sides like stone columns. But as we drove further in, things started to look worse. Some of the buildings were falling apart, covered in mold, and had missing bricks. Some of the windows were broken and old, like they were from the 1940s. They were single glazed, which means they had only one layer of glass. Not a great start. But after following the instructions from the owner, we finally found the small bungalow or cottage we had paid to rent. We had paid for a whole week, which felt like too long to me, but we couldn't afford any longer. Plus, I didn't want to stay any longer, especially after seeing the place. So there we were, sitting in our truck in front of this. Well, it wasn't even a cottage. It looked like it had been built a very long time ago by hand with cobblestone like bricks. The truck was running as I put it in neutral. My husband and I had been taking turns driving. It was around 3 pm. By then, and we hadn't left until late, which caused all the tantrums and arguments. I wondered if this trip was really worth it as we sat there in front of the cottage. So I decided to check out the place. It was important to see if it was even suitable to stay in. It didn't look like a place where people could live comfortably. I know it was summer, but we didn't come here to camp, and having holes in the building wasn't acceptable to me. I wanted my money back, and I wanted it right away. My husband was trying to tell me that this was normal, but I wasn't convinced. So, I stepped out of the car, still arguing, to check out the place. We told the kids to stay in the car, locked it, and then my husband and I went to see what it was like. We found the key where the owner had told us it would be under the floor mat. Opening the door was no problem. When we went inside, it wasn't as bad as I had expected. I went quiet, and my husband was trying to explain that it just looked bad from the outside. Well, as we moved from room to room, I started to think that maybe he was right. It was clean and tidy, a three-bedroom cottage with a bathroom that wasn't covered in mold, falling apart, or filled with sewage. The inside of the place actually looked pretty good, which was surprising given how it looked from the outside. So, we decided to stay. I unlocked the truck and told the kids to come inside. We brought all our suitcases and bags in and got settled. By this time, it was around 4 pm, and we started to relax. The furniture, appliances, and everything inside were old, but it wasn't terrible. The outside of the cottage was in bad shape, but they had made an effort to keep the inside nice. It seemed like they had put in new flooring and did some renovations. As the evening approached, we still had to prepare dinner. I had bought a lot of supplies, including dry pasta, rice, some sauces, and even some meats that were in our cooler in the back. On the first night, we were going to have spaghetti bolognese, and that's when everything went wrong. At that time, I was starting to feel comfortable and relaxed. I was in the kitchen, the kids were in their rooms playing on their iPads, and my husband was sitting and watching the small old TV. I was daydreaming for some reason, not sure why, while preparing the food in the kitchen. I looked out the window. I was actually starting to enjoy this calm feeling. Normally, all I saw was busy traffic on the street below, with the city constantly making noise and bright lights. I'll be honest, I got used to it, but that didn't mean it didn't drive me crazy. I just got used to it over time. As I was cooking, everything was going well. In fact, it didn't take me too long to make the bolognese, maybe about 15 to 20 minutes. I just had to cook the ground meat and boil the pasta. The sauce came in a jar, ready to use. I poured the sauce in, mixed everything together, and heated it in a big frying pan that I had bought, by the way. Yeah, I was a bit picky. My youngest daughter liked to have her bolognese separate from her pasta, which was kind of strange. She preferred to have the spaghetti in one bowl without sauce and the bolognese meat and sauce in another bowl. After I cooked everything and prepared her separate bowls, I served the meal and called everyone to the kitchen table. The kitchen table was old and made of carved wood. It looked like someone had made it by hand, and it was probably the nicest thing in the house, although my husband would disagree, as he was still glued to the old small television. When we all gathered at the table and were ready for dinner, my little girl said something really strange. Just as she was about to eat her spaghetti, she picked up her fork and said, you, mom, 
Why is it green? I glanced over and didn't think much of it, but when I went closer, I noticed that it did have a slight greenish tint. The pasta had a greenish color, which I found a bit odd. I couldn't see it on our plates because it was already mixed with the red bolognese sauce and meat. I told her not to worry and made up a story about it being a different kind of pasta. I wasn't being honest, but I was just so tired from two hours of traveling and the stress of seeing the outside of this place. We all finished our meal, and not more than a couple of hours later, the trouble started. First, my husband had to run to the toilet and was throwing up a lot. Then, my daughter started having really bad diarrhea. Luckily, this cottage had two bathrooms. To make a long and gross story short, we later found out that the water we used to cook the pasta, which came from a well near the cottage on the farm, was contaminated. It hadn't been tested for safety, and it caused all our stomach problems. After that, we all got sick and had to stay in the cottage for four days. It was a tough time. When we finally got better, we went straight back home. But during our illness, we had to have doctors visit us. At one point, my two youngest kids were almost dehydrated because they were vomiting and having diarrhea so much. So, I wouldn't call it a vacation, and it was far from relaxing. The person who owned the farm and estate didn't respond to us after that. We didn't want to take any legal action because we just didn't want to deal with it, and my husband felt the same way. But there was definitely something wrong with the water. It had a greenish color, and the well was clearly contaminated with some kind of bacteria that didn't agree with our stomachs. Those four days were awful, really awful. We were so desperate that my husband ended up staying in one bathroom, and my two children stayed in the other. I stayed outside and used a big bowl I found in the kitchen. It was a large bowl they used for mixing flour and baking. Thankfully, I didn't have diarrhea, but I was very sick too. We all tried to sleep it off, but during those four days, there was constant vomiting and crying. It was terrible, and the worst was on the third day when we called 911 because of my youngest daughter. Every time she tried to drink something, she would just throw it back up. I was getting really scared, but I was so tired that making the call to 911 was hard for me. When the medical team arrived, they gave all of us shots in our behinds to stop the vomiting. It worked, and we all started feeling better. After getting the shots, in the end, we all recovered fully and returned. About two years ago I was looking for a new apartment. I found one on Craigslist that was really inexpensive, $1,000, cheap in the New York City area, two bedrooms, and close to my current job. It was a steal. I email the guy and he emails me back with an apartment application. Loving the price in the apartment, I fill out the application. Part of the application had some specific details about me like phone numbers, work number, where I work etc. I then get a response back from this person and he says that I was accepted and to give him a call. The number was an international number. Good old Google tells me the number was in Nigeria. I was like flux. I've been conned. Anyway, he says that I need to wire him $2,000. $1,000 deposit, and $1,000 first month's rent, and he will FedEx me the keys to the apartment. He gives the Western Union information for me to use for the transfer. He sends another email with pictures of the apartment which were awesome. Hardwood floors, new kitchen appliances, lots of windows. I was in love with this apartment. LOL. I was scared. This guy had my information. Thank goodness that no information like my SSN or driver's license number was needed in the application. For like 4 hours I was trying to figure out what to do. I finally emailed the guy back and told him that I found another apartment for $800 and I had accepted it. I added also that I really could not afford the $1000 and the other apartment was more my budget. I added, thank you for your time, and God bless for good measure. I never heard back from the guy and nothing in my credit report about anything suspicious has come about. I was selling a camper. Guy comes to look at it. He's interested. We negotiate and agree on a price. It was for more money than I paid for the camper three years before. I'm stoked. Find out he's from out of state. Doesn't have a local bank. Can't give me cash. 
wants to write a personal check. I say okay, but I'll hold on to the title and camper until the funds clear into my account. He agrees. I deposit the check and wait. Three days later he texts me that the funds left his account and he wants to come get the camper. I call my bank. Nope. No money in my account yet, it can take more than a week they say. I let him know. He flies off the handle and says I'm trying to cheat him. Guy doesn't understand the process of transferring money between banks with a personal check. He starts threatening me and insisting that he's gonna come get the camper that day. I say no he's not. Then my phone rings. This guy called the cops. I explain what's going on to the officer. He's cool about it. Says to wait a few more days. I do. The fun's clear. I call the buyer in the morning and tell him to meet me at my house. He literally shows up 30 seconds later. He was sitting in his truck a block down the street just out of sight watching my place. He hooks up to the camper and leaves in a huff. One week later I get a text from him apologizing for his behavior. I accepted the apology. I learned from this. Now it's cash only or we go to my bank and the buyer can get a cash advance with their debit card on the spot. Went to the gas station down by my house. I go there daily. It was myself and my partner. We drove over with our two doggies. Small wiener dogs, one is five years, always alert. A barker, other is 11 weeks. Super friendly, once we got there we parked at the pumps. My boyfriend asked what I wanted and went inside. After a couple minutes a man walked out from the station and went to his gold-colored Malibu parked at the next pump beside me. I was holding my phone pretending to not be looking. I do this often I don't like people, and my older dog was in the driver window waiting. She was nit barking or growling. This guy approached the window but still at a distance says she is so cute. Can I pet her? I replied with I don't know she doesn't usually like people. But you can try. He reached towards her. Window was half down. My older dog jumped into the back seat and began barking normal behavior. He then leans into the car halfway and takes her out of my hands. I was trying to keep a grip and but didn't want to hurt my dog so I let go as my boyfriend was finishing up in the gas station. Kind of busy but can see him through the window. My puppy begins to screech as soon as he touches her and my hands leave her. She is screaming like she is in pain. I had adjusted myself and he awkwardly shoves her back to me as I'm trying to snatch her back and my boyfriend is coming out. He asks who the guy was I said I don't know. The guy then got into his car and drove away. We also drove away and went home. I told my boyfriend he wanted to pet the other dog but reached, grabbed the pup and why but shoved her back real quick. I have no clue who he was or is. He said he was rude to the workers and was happy I was okay. A very quick scary interaction. My boyfriend and I recently bought a trailer in the middle of nowhere. We are pretty far from civilization and there's not much work in the city we live. It costs a solid $50 in gas round trip to go into town so needless to say we like to plan accordingly and get all our errands done in one day. Grocery shopping, laundry, etc. What happens from this point I most certainly realize has a ton of red flags however in the moment all in can do is question my own personal sanity. Like I can't even believe I am experiencing this. I find an ad in the domestic section of Craigslist. A couple claims they are getting ready to move and need help watching their newborn baby. May need to do some light housekeeping while the baby is asleep, please include a picture of yourself in the responding email. I go back and forth with the lady and we decide to meet at 12 PM the following day. That morning I am texting with her and let her know I'm running about 15 minutes behind. It was towards the end of the month and I had exceeded my data amount and could not map quest the directions and we had become lost. I went into an apartment complex's office and asked if they would be so kind to please print the directions for me. I had left my phone in the car and while inside the lady had called to give me directions, I had texted her to let her know I'm lost. My boyfriend answered the phone and she became frazzled saying to please hold, that she was backing out her truck right then. Prior to this conversation I had told her that I would prefer to arrive when she was home, she then told me that she was home now but now she isn't and is backing out truck? 
Didn't make a lot of sense however my boyfriend told her I'd be there shortly. I asked him to please walk me to the door. Upon getting to the house, the entire perimeter of their home had about six cameras in all directions. There was a huge storage container on the street. The car in the driveway had a hand-typed sign on window that said baby in car. Then the car parked in front of the house on street had a young pretty Mexican girl couldn't have been more than 20 years old passed out with her mouth open and drooling, windows hardly cracked in the middle of summer. To paint the picture, my boyfriend has some visible tattoos tall white man, heart of gold but could appear intimidating. We knocked on the door several times for a few minutes and didn't get an answer. I call the lady and she says oh just keep knocking he's home. He finally answers the door and the hair on the back of my neck raised. He is very creepy looking and speaks in a thick Russian accent saying no never mind we called someone else. I responded, I just spoke to your wife I don't understand? And he just repeats himself. My boyfriend gets upset and says we drove very far to meet you. Do you have gas money for our time? This man doesn't open the door more than 6 inches during this entire conversation. He then closes the door and locks it, goes to get $20 for us quickly sticks his hand through the door and we leave. As we are walking out we both look at the girl again not moved at all, comment how weird this was. And take off. I call the wife's phone back which is an out of state Google voice phone number. She never answered nor returned any of my text messages. I called my mother to let her know what happened and she insists that we call the police for a welfare check. We did just that. Needless to say I'm a lot more cautious while looking for online gigs and about a week later I'm looking on the same Craigslist section. Craigslist typically will show a map to the major cross streets for where the gig is taking place. This particular area is mainly a college town and only has very few suburban homes, mainly retired couples. Sure enough they posted another ad, same cross streets and request for picture, except a little different gig. This time it was for an in-home dog sitter. I totally feel I dodged a major bullet. Please be careful everyone. I saw a UFO when I was in basic training at Fort Lee Nordwood. I was walking from one building to another to start my firewatch shift when I noticed something as bright as a star make a zigzagging pattern at impossible speeds and then disappear over the horizon. I had never been more clear headed and sober in my life so I'm sure I saw something. Story time. I was a park facility officer in a backcountry park. This park is super isolated. We worked alone for 8 day shifts, and I would go days without seeing anyone during my 8 day shifts at the start of the season. It's much busier now. But at the time, I'd actually ration my visits to the lighthouse to once per shift since they'd be my only human interaction sometimes, and I didn't want to burn them out on me. Lol from the cabin, I had binoculars that allowed me to scan the beach in case campers arrived, and I'd go check their camping tags. One evening, I was scanning the beach, and I had to do a double take. It wasn't the normal wolves, sea lions, elk, deer. Nope. It was a large group of nudists. I felt like a weird voyeur, so I put down the binos and hoped if I gave them an hour or two, they'd want to put on clothes due to the ridiculous swarms of mosquitoes. Nope. That was fun checking their tags. I also had campers come report a dead, murdered, body that had washed up on shore on one of the other beaches in the park. It was really awful for those poor campers. I had to organize the police to come out and retrieve the body. It had been at sea for some time. I'm a park ranger, and for this story, I'll call myself Ranger J. I work in an area of one of America's most famous national parks. I graduated college with an outdoor recreation degree and then entered the park service as a seasonal employee for many years before becoming a full-time permanent employee. It was about 80 degrees, with a clear night sky, and we had just finished our first training session for new seasonals at the ranger station. It was a bunch of new people, and we got the mandatory training out of the way, so we were all free to go home. Most employees lived near the park, 
but there were five other people who lived several miles away from the RMNP's main entrance gate that night, alone. The park has one large dirt road that traverses through it called the Trail Ridge Road. It's very scenic, very beautiful, and only about five miles up from the ranger station. At this time of year, there's no snow on the ground yet, so it's perfect for four-wheel drive or decent-sized trucks to come up and down. So, I took one of the guys with me who lived in town back to his car that he had left on Trail Ridge Road. We drove down, and it was right around 9 p.m. The park was now closed, so there were no visitors around. As we pulled up to one scenic outlook called the Forest Canyon Overlook, I noticed something moving on a hiking trail right below us. It was about 30 feet down from where we were. I had my window rolled down, and there was this horrifying, ear-shattering scream echoing off the canyon walls. The hairs on my neck stood straight up just thinking about it. This was not a human noise. I'm 100% positive after hearing it. It sounded like a mix between an ape and a large bear, and possibly a giant bird. I've never heard anything like it in my life. I don't know what the new guy who was with me thought, but he didn't say anything afterward. As we pulled away, there were two other rangers sitting in their patrol cars about 40 feet behind us. They were facing away from us. I asked them what they thought it was. I couldn't make out any words, but one of the rangers pointed behind me towards where we saw something walking on the trail below us. So, I turned my light bar off, stopped my truck, and got out with the spotlight to see if I could spot anything. By this time, the rangers had gotten out of their cars and were shining their lights with me, but we couldn't see anything. I didn't know what to make of it. I was kind of freaked out at this point, so I decided to go down to where I saw something walking on the trail below us. All the other rangers stayed back. I got out of my truck and started making my way down the closed road with a large 4 million candle spotlight that I carry in my truck to see at night. This way, I can see when I'm patrolling off-road. I didn't go far before I noticed something moving on this rock wall about 30 feet up from me. I took a pic of it and hoped that if I could zoom in on it later, I could see what it was. As I took the picture, Something let out another one of those ear-shattering screams and started moving up and down the rock wall like a monkey would swing through trees. At this point, there was nothing but sheer terror going through my mind. So, I got back to my car, stopped at one of the rangers' cars, and told the rangers that we've got a real problem here. They lit up their spotlights while pointing out, and I saw something moving. We all scanned that area with our lights but did not see anything move or sway in the trees or bushes nearby. After a couple of moments, we didn't see anything anymore. So, I got back into my truck, and I showed them the picture I had taken. The ranger on the left took one look and said, that's a devil dog. I don't even know what that means after hearing that, but my thoughts were confirmed. Whatever it was, we were not looking at any ordinary animal, that's for sure. It's 2004, around 3 a.m. My family and I are preparing for a road trip to the Grand Canyon, we live in SoCal. Everything is getting packed away in the kitchen, and I'm asked to take out the garbage. I walk outside. It's the kind of darkness when it's too early for morning but too late for night, and it's freakishly quiet outside. I thought nothing of it at the time. Our trash cans are located on the side of the house in the backyard halfway to the gate. If you stood at the side of my house looking towards the gate, you would see a hedge to the left of the gate that goes up to your waist. Across the street is another house with a driveway light installed. The light gives off that blaring white security light. Anyway, I get to the trash can to throw away the junk when I look over towards the gate. That's when I saw it, whatever it was. I could only see the outline of it because the blaring white security light was in my eyes, but it was the smoothest and roundest head I've ever seen, which connected to very slouched shoulders. At first, I didn't know what I was looking at, just an odd shape the same height as the hedges. It wasn't until it moved silently and slowly towards the bottom of the hedge and into the neighbor's yard that I saw it looked headish. I was 14 at the time and just stood there, 
waiting for more movement or sound. After about a minute, yeah, I waited, of not hearing anything, I stepped backwards until I was able to sprint back towards the kitchen door. I don't know what it was or why it moved so silently, but it wasn't much longer before we moved out of that house due to strange things. But that's a story for another time, or at least another post. Okay, so Friday at 1.28 am, my friends and I decided to go for a drive. We sometimes like to go to the mountains to experience something that only happens in that area, paranormal and supernatural. Like any other time we do this, we go in my car and drive past Home Hill, heading towards the mountains. We park across from VHS, about a mile and a half away, then we sit and take in the scenic beauty of the dark desert. We start by listening closely to anything and looking everywhere, being hyper-observant. At first, we saw a light in the distance traveling flat on the desert land, getting within about a mile away from us, then disappearing altogether. Moving on from where we had, I mean, I just see something else driving through roads and flying by at least 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. We turned down a familiar road. This is where we knew that something was about to change. Me and everyone else looked to the right side of the car, and we all saw what we believed to be something like a skinwalker, a massive black dog just hunched over at my car. While I was going 45 miles an hour through the road, we should have felt the impact from the massive creature, but we didn't. Both people in the back seat looked and saw this thing rise up from the ground and stand straight up on two legs, absolutely huge and all black, with red eyes that are forever imprinted in my mind. I didn't slow down but sped up, going about 55 miles an hour now, so probably about 20 yards away. They saw it rise up as if nothing happened to it. I received a telephone call from a woman whom I will refer to as a Y. When A.Y. was growing up in the 1970s, she would spend a lot of her time with her aunt who lived in the northeast suburbs of Detroit. The neighborhood had many acres of woodland, as well as old dilapidated properties that were covered in vegetation. A few hundred yards behind her aunt's home were old abandoned houses that attracted the attention of many of the kids in the neighborhood. The kids would talk about the hairy guy who spent a lot of time in one of the large abandoned buildings. A.Y. was curious so she accompanied some of the kids into the woods. Sure enough, as they stood near the house, they would occasionally see the hairy guy look out of the large broken window on the first floor. They were scared to go into the house and investigate, but they were also fascinated by the hairy guy. A.Y. described the face as that of a caveman with a wide flat nose. The hair was black and stringy. There had been talk in the area for many years of a huge hairy creature that would be seen roaming the neighborhood at night, but nobody ever seemed to get a good look at this thing. In the winter of 2016, A.Y. was living in her aunt's old house, which she moved into after her aunt passed. She was returning home from work when she noticed that several people were gathered around what appeared to be a multi-car accident at the end of the street. There was a lot of ice and snow on the road, so she figured that may have been the reason for the accident. But as she looked closer, the first thing she noticed was that one of the cars was literally upside down and teetering on the heavy branches of a large oak tree. Another car looked like it had been tossed into the adjacent bushes. She walked over to the scene and listened to one of the drivers, her neighbor, attempt to explain to the police officer that this big hairy man walked out in front of me. I scared it and it got really mad. I jumped out of the car and ran into the house. As she watched from the window of her house, the hairy creature picked up the small car and tossed it into the oak tree. Then it pushed a parked car into a yew bush and then flipped it on its side. The police seemed to think the woman was either impaired or crazy, but A had thought back to the hairy guy in the woods. As she walked back to her house, she soon noticed a trail of huge footprints in the snow along the side leading to the woods in the back. She took a few photos of the tracks, but she didn't say anything to anyone other than her nephew who told A why that it was a Bigfoot. A is positive that is was the same creature she saw when she was a girl. 
Her nephew has been setting trail cams for the past three years, but he has been unable to capture any photographic evidence. The abandoned houses in the woods had since been razed. I had a rather odd encounter with some humanoid creature or even spirit possibly, just a few nights ago, and I haven't been able to come up with a rational answer to just what I had seen. I suppose I will start with the story now. It happened just a few nights ago when I was biking home from work. I work the closing shifts for my local Walgreens, so I get off work around 10.30. I live only 30 minutes away by bike from my job, but most of the way home is by a heavily forested trail, which doesn't have very many street lights, so it's always pitch black when I'm going home. Well, about 5 minutes into the bike ride going home, I hit the beginning of where the street lights ended and darkness began, and like I always do, I pull out my phone and turn on the flashlight option so I can illuminate my way home. Well, only a few seconds after I turned it on, I tilted it up more and froze because I saw this tall, skinny pale looking figure for a brief second before it fell onto all fours and, like the wind, was gone into the woods. Shortly after, I started to pedal as fast as I could because I had no clue what it was that I had seen. When I heard a low screech and whatever it was keeping pace with me hidden in the woods out of sight. I managed to get out of that area very quickly and didn't see or hear anything after I left that heavily wooded area. But a while later, I caught scent of what literally smelled like fresh blueberry pancakes or waffles, as if someone was standing out in the field with a hot plate of just off the pan blueberry waffles or pancakes, which didn't make sense to me as there are no buildings in the area where that scent was. So I figured perhaps whatever it was I had seen was possibly using scents to try to draw me into the fields or woods. Now I do know a few areas around the trail are supposedly haunted. There's a dinner theater that's not too far from it, and a supposed haunted water tower in the area as well, and a couple of other places. But no matter what I think of, I can't rationalize it or debunk it as something else. It couldn't be a deer because I have talked to people around the area and no one's seen a deer ever in the area, and besides, it was standing on two feet when I saw it, like it was a humanoid. It couldn't have been any other wildlife because the only wildlife I have spotted are squirrels and birds. But I figured I would share my experience and see if anyone has had something similar or may know a possible rationalized explanation for what I could have seen. This is going to be pretty long, so I apologize for that. I'm trying to include as much information as I can. As far as I know, the creature has never tried harming me, but it has oftentimes made me feel unsafe and threatened. As the years have passed, I began paying less mind to it and just putting the feeling in the back of my mind. January 2012, I bought a horse and began boarding it at a very old barn. It was a small, tight-knit, friendly barn community not far from my home. It had been around since the 60s, surrounded by woods. There were three barns, the main arena was entirely surrounded by thick woods, and there were small trails in the woods behind the property. Fast forward to June 2012, I had two horses there now. I was there every single day without fail, 2 p.m. 10 p.m. I fed the horses and cared for them. I rode one every night as well mainly in the arena, but sometimes in the barnyard. There were no field or arena lights, just the moon and stars. One evening, around 5 p.m., I was sitting on her, letting her stand when she started snorting and backing up. I looked up and saw this white or gray creature crawling out of the woods towards us. It had a very small round head, its eyes were just pits. It had a very small mouth, not much detail there. Its arms were very long and thin, fingers also like that. Its rib cage was very pronounced and defined, and its legs were long and lanky. Its movements were very jerky, not smooth and fluid. It slowly jerked out to us, when my horse turned and bolted out of the arena. She's a dead broke, calm, well-manners horse who never spooked before this. Stubborn old mare, but not spooky. She would not go back into the arena that night. 
I walked her around the barn yard, staying near the main barn, put her up, and ran out to peek into the arena, to find nothing except some footprints where I saw the thing. Throughout the summer, I saw it peeking, almost dancing, around the gate that lead into the woods where the trails were. One night roughly a month later, at about 9 p.m., I was riding that horse again in a front pasture. The moon is full and bright, and I look to my left to see the creature running full spread by my side on the other side of the fence, I slowed my horse to a stop and it took off around the corner and behind the side barn into the woods. I continued seeing it, mainly in the woods, but it was always around. Summer 2013, the barn shut down when the owner died. We moved the horses to a friend's place for the time being, and I didn't see it there. Late summer, fall 2013, I found a new barn. Woods directly behind the barn and arena. This place had lights and was much newer. About a month later, when I was getting ready to leave I heard something in the woods, I looked down the barn all into the woods and saw the creature running down the road into the woods. I saw it much less frequently for a while, until later in fall 2014 I began seeing it in the back pastures woods, it darted in and out of the tree line. I saw a second one sitting in a neighbor's yard, it would sit in the same spot every day and watch me ride started taking pictures, which are very poor and crappy, and sent them to a friend who claimed he and some others have seen it. Kept seeing it occasionally, but from a much greater distance than at the first barn. I went with this barn owner to another farm to get some stuff, when I saw a very very large version of this creature run out from the woods, right behind a tree I was 10 feet from, while I was alone by the trailer. Last November, a house sat for the barn owners. I went out around 2 am to fill water troughs and enjoy the full moon and cool night. I was sitting in the back pasture when three of the creatures began coming from the woods, one came up to the trees near the trough where I was, the other two were walking along the tree line. The horses were silently munching their hay, pretty far from where the creatures were. I messaged the guy from earlier and told him what was going on. Since that incident, I haven't really seen them. Last summer, I did see one outside my house staring into the windows. A few weeks ago, one was outside my bedroom windows tapping and making a strange faint shrieking sound. This was a lot to type out, but I hope someone reads this and helps me figure this out some more. I'm very open and willing to discuss more paranormal things that have happened with this, my friends experiences with this, and anything else that could or could not be connected to this thing. Pennsylvania had many reported paranormal phenomena from ghosts to UFO sightings occurring for decades. The state is even home to several famous cryptids such as Bigfoot, Mothman, Goatman along with a few visitation by the New Jersey Devil. One of the lesser known and probably the most pitiful of creatures believed to inhabit the northern western woods of Pennsylvania is the Squonk. The squonk is a legendary animal believed to live within the hemlock forests in the northwestern part of the state. They are described timid and ugly in appearance as the creature's skin is sagging while covered with moles and warts. Legends claim the squonk is constantly weeping because it's ashamed of its body and will often try to avoid being seen. This creature is said to have a unique ability to escape capture from hunters by dissolving completely into a pool of tears and bubbles when cornered. One well-known story about a captured squonk told in Pennsylvania involves a man named J.T. Wentling. Sometime in the early 1900s, the creature's skin was valuable and Mr. Wentling went out hunting for one. One night with a full moon, he tracked the animal down by following the glistening trail made from its tears. Upon sighting the squonk, Mr. Wentling coaxed it into a bag by imitating the creature's weeping under a hemlock tree. While carried his prize home, he suddenly noticed that the bag was lighter, and on opening it, found nothing inside but tears and bubbles. This may be the source of their scientific name, Lacrima corpus dissolvens, from the Latin words for dissolving body. The legend of the squonk has been spoken in Pennsylvania since the early 19th century with the first written account made in book by William T. Cox called Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods, with a few desert and mountain beasts, 1910.
lumberjacks and hunters were mainly the source of early sightings of the creature. Several cryptozoologists theorize the squonk may be resulted from encounters with malformed wild boars within the time period as there are no new accounts of the creature reported. Essentially myself and another guy had received pellet guns for Christmas a few days earlier, and we were out in the woods above our parents' houses screwing around with them before dinner. It was about 4 p.m., the light was starting to fade, but there was still really good visibility under the canopy of trees. We'd been out there for a few minutes when the other guy went up on a ridge just out of the wooded area for a bit, and I stood on the trail just inside the woods trying to unjam my pellet gun. I heard a twig snap, looked up, and this thing walked casually, purposefully, between bunches of trees about 75 feet in front of me. As it passed in front of me it turned its head and looked right at me, but it made no other sign of altering course, aggression, or anything else. Just stared at me and kept walking until it was out of sight behind the overgrowth. As can probably be expected, I lost my shit and ran out of there as fast as I could. For years, literally years afterward I was plagued with the feeling that I was being watched in the woods. My bedroom window faced the woods, and I'd lie there at night turned away, feeling, knowing, that if I looked at the window there'd be something looking in at me. Whenever I walked anywhere near where I'd seen it, my chest would zeets up without me realizing what was going on, and it'd be hard to breathe. The weirdest part is that I'd get tears in my eyes, tears streaming down my face like I was crying, but I wouldn't be sobbing, no runny nose. The things that stick out to me, burned into my brain. It was tall, probably 7 feet or more, it was skinny, almost emaciated looking, and had an oddly shaped face. The face looked almost like a squished, yet smoothed out, monkey's face that too small for the head. It was medium grey in color, and either smooth or with very short hair, and the eyes were black. It had a long, black nail the length of a steak knife sticking from each finger and kept the fingers curled slightly to keep them bunched up while it walked. It was not trying to hide, seemed unconcerned that I was there, and made no attempt to come closer to me or to get away. It just turned its head as it passed in front of me, and looked directly at me as it walked. I don't talk to a lot of people about it, but I've heard anecdotes, unsolicited, that indicate the things been seen by a bunch of other people in my hometown too, people well outside my social circles. To be clear here I don't believe in God, Jesus, or demonic possession. I don't believe in mutants, escaped government experiments, the Bilderbergs, conspiracies, Morgulians, or that vaccines cause autism, and I think that while there's probably alien life out there, I very strongly doubt it's coming to earth to peep in windows and scare the shit out of teenagers walking through the woods in their remote ass hometown. I don't know what the hell it is, but it sure was a bizarre encounter. It doesn't seem to have actually harmed anyone or anything, and it's been around for most of my life if the reports are true, so who knows what it's up to. I don't expect anyone to believe this. I don't blame you if you don't, sometimes I'm not sure I believe it myself. Regardless, it is 100% true. I was driving in the woods years ago. It was a pretty familiar area, to this day I can drive to the exact spot it happened. It was summer and I drive a convertible, so the top was down. Maybe somewhere around 2 am ish. It was a very clear night, but it had stormed earlier, not really relevant, just trying to give as much detail as I can. On the horizon of the right side of my car, I see flashes of amber light in the distance. At first I thought it was an emergency vehicle, but I know the area well, and there was no road where the lights were coming from, nothing but woods for miles, in fact. I almost crashed the car trying to figure out the lights, there was a tree down in the road that I almost hit from the storm earlier. I have to stop the car and turn around, it's a two-lane road with no lights nearby whatsoever. Nothing but starlight and my headlights. As I turn my car around, in the middle of the road, my headlights land on this thing, I guess. Whatever it is, 
It was eight feet tall at least, at least that's my best guess, it was much taller than me at six feet. I stopped the car, why I did so, I couldn't tell you, I don't know myself. But I did, and shut the lights off, and this thing, it was definitely humanoid, and definitely not human, had some sort of luminescence about it. Its skin glowed a dull, white light. The thing started to move towards the car, Ad was making terrible noises. Hoarse, moaning noises, that's the best way I see a described the sound it made. As it got closer I could make out its features, I wear glasses and my prescription is very outdated. I know, bad idea driving at night like that, but anyway. Again it was very tall, and very very thin. I remember thinking if it was human it would have starved to death long ago. Its arms were out of proportion, as was its neck, they were abnormally long, its arms were nearly to its knees. It had wrinkled, worn, leathery looking skin, which was the purest white I had ever seen. The wrinkles of its skin made it look impossibly old, it folded over itself and over again. The best way to describe it would be looking like some combination of maggot, birch bark, and wet newspaper. Like if you cut your finger, and wear a bandage way too long, and you take the bandage off and the skin is sickly white and wrinkled. That, but everywhere. The closer it got, I could see more, its eyes, or apparent lack thereof. They just looked like large, deep, dark holes. Its mouth was crooked and way too wide, if it had ears, the corners of the mouth would be right up to them. PHS moaning, limping, shuffling thing came too close for comfort finally, and I had seen enough. I started my car and took the nope train right out of there. I drove 90 all the way home. In hindsight I regret leaving. I had the strong impression, after the fact, that the thing was injured or sick or even dying. It did not look well, and whatever it was, I think perhaps it only wanted help. In hindsight I hoped it had found help, or had at least come to a swift end, as it was obviously suffering. A little bit of background, this was in southwest Michigan, and myself, I have been employed in the past as a paramilitary contractor, which means I have had plenty of psych evaluations mandatory for the job. I am perfectly sane except for chronic insomnia, and I absolutely do not do drugs other than cigarettes and the very occasional beer. Anyway, this is my story. Like I said, I don't expect you to believe it, but it is the honest truth. I guess I just really want to know what this thing was, if anyone has seen anything similar. Hell, it's been a few years and it's one of those stories you tell when the subject of high strangeness comes up. In my late teens to my 30s I would frequently go ghost hunting with my friends. This particular incident happened around 1998 and my idea of ghost hunting was going into creepy places and looking for ghosts. No equipment and no plans. Just us being stupid. We rarely even remembered to bring flashlights. The group consisted of myself and my three best friends, one of whom had brought along his girlfriend who in turn brought along her best friend. The six of us had begun investigating on an old abandoned and very unsafe creepy barn and hence succeeded in nothing more than freaking out the two girls. One of my friends suggested an old ruin we knew of so we went back to check it out. We arrived at the old ruin which was out in the middle nowhere in Southern California's high desert at exactly midnight. The guys all got out of the truck. The girls refused to get out. We immediately spread out. The three other guys moved off to their right to explore the perimeter of the property while I headed straight for the ruin. The ruin was easily identifiable by the light of the full moon. All that remained were three foot tall cinder block and rebar outline of a building on a slightly raised cement slab surrounded by rubble. It hadn't been a large building by the look of it having a short central hall with two rooms on either side. No sooner do I step foot on the threshold of the building do I look up and see something. The best way I can describe this thing is when you take black and white play dough and mix it together into a streaked, vaguely humanoid shaped golem with a round head. I watched this thing, visible only from the waist up, glide smoothly from left to right just outside the far side of the ruin. 
As it reached the far end of the building I calmly did an about face and walked back to the truck. I wasn't scared. I didn't panic. Until recently, I just accepted simply that the sight of this thing had just overloaded my mind and my understanding of the world and had simply seen enough. As I reached the truck I realized that both girls were gazing past me towards the ruins with eyes the size of saucers. Though there was nothing there when I turned around both girls in unison described the exact same thing I had seen and claimed it was standing in the exact same spot on the threshold where I had just been when I saw it. There's not much else to say except the girls and I waited in the truck until the others back came. I've been to a lot of cemeteries in and around Albany, New York. I've been to the Pinewood Cemetery the most, every time I've experienced something paranormal. There's another cemetery on that side of the Hudson River in Winnenskill that had directions on what to do when you get there and what I saw was the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. A post on the internet said something like walk into the cemetery and walk up the grass hill to the back right, turn around and you will see what you're going to see. If you look away you won't see it again. We did that and there was what looked like a black transparent dress between three trees and waving like it was in the wind. There was no wind. Surrounded by what I'd describe as black beer bags scattering like a a swarm of bees or something. We watched for a few minutes then looked at each other and it was gone. I am going to start off by saying that this post is completely legitimate. This is not fiction. This is something real that I have experienced. My hope for sharing this experience on the internet is that I can find someone else who has witnessed the same thing as me. Or something similar. As I have been searching for answers for years. Also, maybe someone can give me some insight on what this could be. I don't expect anyone to truly believe what I'm writing. I know it is unbelievable. But I know my truth. This experience is something that changed my life completely. Also would like to note that during my life I have had lots of paranormal and spiritual experiences. I don't consider myself a religious person, but I believe in God. I've witnessed too many miracles and things not to believe. When I had this experience I was 18, I am now 22. One night, years ago I was hanging out with my now ex-boyfriend. It was either November or December of 2019. We decided that night that we wanted to look at the stars. It was very cold out and probably around 1 am, but that did never stop us from going outside. We put on extra layers, grabbed a blanket and laid out to look at the stars. Most of the night we were having fun, laughing and taking. There was one point where our conversation got very serious. He started explaining to me that he didn't believe in God. Or anything at all. He believes nothing will happen when we die. My response to that was I respect his beliefs but I believe in God. I know something will happen when we die. I've witnessed too many spiritual things in my life not to believe. I've always had a knowing that something more is out there. His only response was once he sees something, he'll believe it. We were quiet for a while after that but eventually continued talking about other things and having fun. That's when I saw something in the sky. What I saw was a massive pair of wings gliding directly above me. It was at least 18 to 20 feet. I couldn't make out a head, legs, or tail. Just a massive pair of wings. It was dark and hard to see but the wings had a subtle glow just enough for me to see it. It almost looked see-through but also glowing. Can't be for sure though. It was a shocking thing to see. I wasn't necessarily horrified, but I was in complete awe. I didn't feel anything negative. My ex wasn't paying attention at first. I shouted at him to look up. When he did, he immediately started panicking. He was swearing and freaking out. The pair of wings wasn't there for long. It just flew above us then above my house and seemed to disappear or just faded into the darkness. As it was flying, it only flapped its wings once. So really it was gliding. My ex had grabbed me and insisted we go inside. He was horrified. We didn't get much sleep that night. Eventually, the next day after calming down, 
we decided we wanted to go out at night again and see if anything else happens. There was a lot more that happened, I won't get into too much detail about. We saw strange UFOs and two big bright lights that appeared to be close to us. So bright that it was hard to see. That itself was very scary and unusual. But the strangest thing was the wing being or thing. After this happened my perspective of life changed completely. There is so much out there that we don't know about. Not that it's related, but weird things started happening around the world too. Covid, Ukraine, Chinese spy balloon, so much more. There is just so much happening. I have searched and talked to so many people to see if maybe they experienced something similar but I can't find much information. I do believe that maybe what I saw was an angel. Or could be an interdenominational being. I'm not sure. I don't think I'll ever know for sure. I've accepted that. Again, as unbelievable as it sounds, this is something real that has happened to me, and my ex-boyfriend. Feel free to tell me your thoughts. Hopefully this reaches someone who witnessed something similar. February 25, 2016, it was a normal day and the sun was going down. I was home one night, and both my mother and stepfather were home too. I assumed they were asleep. I let the dog in the backyard. I noticed it was a little warmer than usual out. Also, it was a pretty clear sky, so I went out back to stargaze. While I was outside I felt something in the air. Some sort of static buzz, I felt it in my stomach and it felt like my bones were vibrating. I followed the feeling and looked over the fence to see where it was coming from. I couldn't believe my eyes, it was a triangular UFO craft landing on the street in front of my house. I couldn't tell if the craft had legs or not. It had orange, purple, blue, green, red, and white lights on it. I remember thinking that it was weird nobody on my street was seeing it. I saw a door open on the craft that formed a ramp that touched the street. Baffled and babbling I went inside and as I rushed to the kitchen sink I said to myself, it's not real you're just crazy. It's not real you're just crazy. I washed my face with some cold water and looked out of the window above the kitchen sink. I saw a little girl in an old school pink dress with blonde hair. I estimated her age at about 5 to 7 years old and she was holding the hand of a shadow person leaving the craft with her. I couldn't see any details of the silhouette she was holding the hand off or inside the craft due to the bright white light. I thought it was weird how I could see the details of the girl but not the other thing. As I saw this, I heard a little girl's voice say Luke. Come with me. Daddy. It's so good to see you daddy. Don't you want to come with me? But it was said inside my mind. I went from baffled and babbling to terrified and panicked to the highest degree. I left the kitchen, ran slash, and stumbled into the living room. The voice of the little girl died down. I began wondering if I was having a nightmare. I looked at the time, it was 10.33. I then thought to myself, if I was dreaming, how could I possibly know the time? I felt an approaching presence. I slowly turned around and saw a silhouette of the shadow type man at the front door. If you could call that thing a man. I could see it through the foggy glass of the front door that still had Valentine's Day decorations on it. It had long spidery fingers that it deliberately flaunted. As if it knew what I was seeing through the mind. It began to laugh but not out loud, in my head. As it did I saw its mouth open and close like when a cartoon character laughs. I was shaking and trembling. I immediately tried to plan a route to my mom's room but I decided on a shortcut that would lead me through the fireplace to the left of me and into my mom and stepdad's room. I ran to the double-sided fireplace. And as I started crawling on my hands and knees I heard it tell me you won't escape, we've taken you many times before and there is nothing you can do. I looked at my ash-covered arms as I tried to continue to crawl through the fireplace. I looked into my mom's room. My mother and stepfather were both lying in bed on their backs but with their heads facing me. Their eyes were screaming. It was like they both were having sleep paralysis. The dark voice said, they can't help you, they are frozen. 
Then I heard the buzzing in the air turn into rumbling and I heard a chant that sounded like the chant of a dead language, Zim Ma Bu Ea It Er. The chant was very repetitive, and the same syllables were chanted over and over. As the rumble intensified a white light was washing over everything. I tried to move but as it grew stronger, I grew weaker. It became so loud and so bright I was blind and deaf, overloaded by too much light and too much sound. Everything went white. I woke up in what seemed like a half second later. Face down and tongue out on my bed, shoes on and fully clothed. My boots were on my pillow, almost as if whoever took me didn't know that it was for my head so they placed me on my bed backwards and face down. I sat up in shock. I ran into the bathroom to check on myself in the mirror. I opened my mouth and saw that my tongue was cracked, dehydrated, and dry. It was like a dead man's decaying tongue. I could peel pieces of skin off it, it was so dry. I washed my mouth with water until it was hydrated enough for me to talk. I remember, sitting there in front of the mirror for a second, thinking about what happened. I remember thinking how do I explain something like this. I broke down and began crying hysterically. What made it worse was if that little girl was my daughter, would I ever see her again? Would I ever get to know her? Is she safe? Is she okay? I don't even know her name. How do I find closure in knowing a daughter I never knew I had is out there without me, and with whatever took me? How do I move on from knowing that I'll never get to see her grow up? How do I cope knowing I can't reach her, and I can't help her? I practically fell downstairs to tell my mom and stepdad what happened. I knocked on their door and my stepdad answered. I was babbling, shaking, and crying the story out of my mouth. But it made no difference because my stepdad said last night? I don't know what you're talking about. He closed the door. I sat on the couch in the living room and quietly cried as I questioned my sanity. It was 5.55 am. Are you familiar with the Custer Battlefield in Montana? Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument. Just to put things in perspective, I'm 65 years old now. This took place in the early 90s and I used to, I don't do it so much anymore. I used to have a Dodge van and on vacation time I would always throw a futon in the back of it, a sleeping bag, my Coleman camping stuff and I'd hit the road for two or three weeks and go visit places. One trip I went back east, I'm from back east. I'm from Ohio. And I've been in Monterey now for the last 40 years. And I visited Civil War battlefields, Antietam, Gettysburg, Harper's Ferry and on one trip I went up to see Custer's Mountain up there in Montana, and where it is, it's up there in the prairies and it's surrounded by a lot of mountains. It is small. It's on. The intersection of State 90 and U.S. Route 212 which goes east and west. It's a little east of Billings, Montana. And 212 starts at 90 and runs right behind Custer's Hill and goes to Spearfish, Sturgis, Deadwood, you know, that part of the country. Anyway, so I've been on the road for 4 or 5 days already on this trip and I'm tired and I need to take a shower or jump in a river, someplace. I get to the park at 8 o'clock at night. It's already closed so I'm not going to go in and see the monument that night. I was also really hungry. Now down where this was at is this little general store that has a cafe in it. So I pulled in the parking lot right there and they were getting ready to close. It was this guy and his wife and the guy was a retired park ranger who used to take out tours of the monument and he knew it really well. And his wife was Native American and she lived there with her whole family for generations. And you know after the battle the Native Americans just didn't go away. They all still live around there in the following generations. Anyway, so they make me something to eat. And I asked them if they happened to have a beer I could drink and they said no they said go up the road a couple miles to this little town called Crow Agency, buy a 12 pack, bring it back and we'll help you drink it. So I did that. I went up there and got a 12 pack and I brought it back and for the next couple hours they told me the true story of Custer's battle and it was really riveting. Parts of the story you never heard of. 
It wasn't like Errol Flynn dying on the hill like in the movies, it was a long, drawn-out battle, and it was multifaceted. There were other parts of the battle. Other sections of the battle. Anyway, they were getting ready to close up. They had to go home. I asked them if I could camp out in their parking lot. They said no, I couldn't do that, but there is a little access road off Route 212 about a mile down the road and it's a dirt road and due to maintenance of the park, you can pull into that spot, and nobody will bother you. I said, that's great. I went down the road. I found the spot, backed into it, and turned off the van. It was dark, starry and it was quiet and it was just out here in the prairies. It wasn't eerie at all. It was just neat, right, and it was dark and it was starry. So I rolled back into my sleeping bag and I went to sleep and I was out like a light. So it must have been a couple hours later, I'm sleeping, I guess I'm sleeping. Maybe I'm dreaming. I'm hearing this noise, back of my mind, small, ethereal. I hear men shouting. I'm hearing horses. I'm hearing gunshots. I'm laying there thinking I gotta be dreaming this. You know how you're in our EM sleep, you can't move, right? And it comes and it's going and it's fading and it's coming back. And it's getting louder. Now I'm waking up and I'm hearing this. You know how you wake up to a bad dream and you go, oh my god, that was a bad dream and it goes away? This didn't go away. It's getting louder. I'm hearing this. I'm looking at my hands. I'm awake. I'm hearing this. What is this? I throw open the side doors of the van. I jump out and there's nothing. There's nothing. It's dark. It's starry and a little cool and it's still going on. Horses and gunshots and men. I'm hearing this. Then it just started fading away. And then it was gone. The whole episode probably lasted three minutes. The whole rest of the night, I crawled back in the van. I sat there wrapped in my sleeping bag completely spooked. The next day I went and visited the park and then I left but that night it was weird. I'd just like to say that I am not making anything up. All of this 100% happened. I find it somewhat therapeutic to share information like this. Generally, people aren't very kind and I have been laughed at and called deplorable things for sharing accounts like this. I feel these types of things are important to share so that other people who have things like this happen to them would feel less like an outcast. I am on the bashful side of the personality spectrum so I am definitely not seeking attention. My parents were from a small Mississippi town that has had many UFO sightings, heavy paranormal activity, cryptid sightings, and general strangeness. Maybe this has something to do with what I have been experiencing 40 miles away, in a heavily populated area that doesn't have a single snooze hour in its operation. I don't fancy the idea of this high strangeness following me but I don't know how else to describe it. It followed me, or should I say, us. My parents moved to the city sometime in the mid-1990s and years later, I was born. The first experience I'd like to share happened around January 2012, I was attending an extracurricular mentoring program at a school and there were hundreds of people there. We, the students were assigned seats and the names of our mentors were taped to a chair in each row. Unfortunately, my group's mentor wasn't there so peers started to get up and wander around. I didn't. I just sat there and vaguely looked in the direction of the mentor speaking in front of me out of boredom. He was talking to my classmates in the row in front of me. He was their mentor. He wore glasses and had almost icy blue eyes. I was just looking in his direction and I saw this man's eye change into a vertical pupil. Like a slit, reptilian-like. I still don't believe I saw that, but why would he get nervous after that happened? He peeped at me from the corner of his eye while still addressing the students in front of me. It was a slit pupil. It was still blue but the pupil was vertical. I kind of did a double take and slightly frowned in confusion at why I saw that. What confirmed it was that he got nervous after this. I don't think anyone else saw it or they did and they were like me, utterly shocked and confused. Maybe he wasn't expecting me to notice because he had glasses on. Why would he look at me while his eyes like that? 
perhaps an involuntary shapeshift? I'm an open-minded person, however, I still take a lot of things I hear on the internet with a grain of salt until I actually experience it. Did I see what people call a reptilian shapeshifter? Why would he take an interest in mentoring a bunch of human teenagers? I don't know. What I do know is, it was not normal and if it wasn't for the hundreds of people in the auditorium, I would have run out of there. It's not creepy because he was non-human, it's creepy because he was masquerading as a human so we wouldn't suspect anything. For the most part, I've just sort of brushed off these experiences but at times, they can become intense. In the midsummer of 2012, I was lying in bed and watching the TV. Literally out of nowhere, I got this vibe from the window as if someone was staring at me. It felt horrible. My mind was telling me to run but I just laid there in bed. I turned the TV up to cut through the feeling that had built up in my room. I faked a laugh at what I was watching on TV because I knew something was staring at me from the window at this point. In my mind, I thought that my laughing would trick whatever was out there into thinking I wasn't paying attention to the horrible vibe it was giving off, pretending as if I didn't know it was there. Right after I faked laughing, whatever it was started to tap at the window. Loudly. These were solid tap tap like it was letting me know that I didn't fool it. The tapping was hard enough to make the window shake a little. It would scrape at the window screen as well. I could not jump out of bed and down the hall to the bathroom quick enough. I stood there in the bathroom absolutely terrified. I had to lean against my vanity to keep my legs from giving out from trembling. I sat there for about a good 20 minutes half expecting to see something peep around the corner into the bathroom at me and half contemplating to go sleep with my parents. I really didn't want to wake them but I felt if I had gone back in my room that night, something bad was going to happen to me. I slept with my parents that night. It is actually hilarious when I think about it now, a giant teenager nestled between her parents in a bed. Wasn't funny while this was happening though. I was scared out of my mind. They asked me what was wrong and I just said, I was going to camp out with them that night. I was not about to go back into that room and get abducted, eaten, or whatever. Screw that. In all seriousness, no way that was a physical person. My room is on the second story of a house surrounded by an 8-foot wooden, deadbolt fence at the end of a yard. No way it was a bird because birds are not usually active at 1 to 2 a.m. in the morning. Plus, birds, the species around here, beaks are too small to make a noise like that. It was definitely not a squirrel. I tried to recreate the noise the next day with my nails on the window and I could not. My nails sounded too dull against the glass. I'm 99% certain it was not an animal either. It seemed too intelligent and could taunt. We still live in the same house in the same heavily populated area. I don't know where it could have come from or where it could have gone. I'm going to be honest, the tapping at the window sounded like it came from something with developed claws. If I had to guess digits, maybe 2 to 5. The vibe this being gave off was not a good one and this is exactly why I do not sit out in the backyard at night in my garden anymore and I make sure to lock my window before the sun goes down. I'd like to note that this tapping on the window incident happened two times over two summers. One time in July of 2011 and the other more aggressive one, in July of 2012. The one from 2011 wasn't as loud or intimidating as the latter one. I haven't experienced it after these two years. Nevertheless, high strangeness still occurs. Around late June of this year, however, I was woken at 4 am by this scrubbing sound followed by a thack sound against the walls near my room from outside. It went up the wall to the ceiling and back down and towards the window. I do not know what that was. A misguided squirrel or bird? Highly unlikely. This next experience, 2012, happened at night, again, I was lying in bed watching the TV. Then there was this hissing that started coming from the window. It was faint but definitely there. I was not imagining it. I still get creeped out by this, it puts me in a trance. I was staring at the window in a trance and I could not move. When the hissing stopped, I regained my senses. It's happened multiple times. 
I don't like that something can have control over my locomotion like that. It continued to happen throughout the years. Just last year around September, I was taking a shower and out of nowhere, there was this loud hiss that originated in one of the corners of the shower followed by a ringing tone in my left ear. I jumped because of how loud the hissing was. I'm a bit more relaxed now but still very cautious when I take a shower. It is very uncomfortable to be aware of something that may be watching me bathe. In March of 2013, I was lying in bed with my eyes closed. I was not sleeping but I was at the going to sleep state if that makes sense. It was broad daylight but all I felt like doing was laying down to sleep. In this state, laying in bed, eyes closed, I felt like I was being sucked through some sort of tunnel. I was conscious of myself in the bed but I was going somewhere else too. I was completely immobile and could feel this tingling sensation all over. At the end of this tunnel, I could see a room. But before I reached this room I started to pull myself back. There was an instinctive nope reaction on my part and I started to pull myself back. When I made it back, I immediately got up. I'm not sure what that was about. I also heard a voice during this incident in a monotone say something along the lines of, how can you believe in extraterrestrials and God? I know, it seems so corny but that's what it sounded like it said. I am not sure why, whoever it was, would say something like that. In 2014, this is very embarrassing for me and might be TMI but I feel I need to share it. I started having this feeling in my private area equivalent to a large object forcing its way inside of me. It got to the point where it was disabling, and very painful and it hurt to walk. It was a sore, throbbing pain. This would happen out of nowhere. I'd be sitting on the couch, instant pain. Laying down, instant pain. I checked myself and could not find out what the problem was. This was around the same time when I had to go to my pediatrician because of the irregular cycles I was having. I would not have a cycle for 5 months at a time. No injuries, no hormonal irregularities. Nothing. They could not find out what was wrong with me. And then, in October of 2014, I had a dream, I'm sure it was a recollection of some sort, where I was in this brightly lit room. I had no clothes on and I could not see where this light was coming from nor could I see anything else. I felt very dazed. I felt my hand being grabbed and guided toward this room that had a back stretcher type chair in it. It looked like the thing elderly people use to help their backs but silver in color with this sort of rim going around the top of it. Again, I hope this is making sense because I cannot draw. I was placed in this chair. The next thing I remember is having this needle being inserted into my right upper arm. I watched as the needle was placed there and I felt no pain. I couldn't see who grabbed my hand nor could I see who placed the needle in my arm. I was then shown a screen on the wall in front of me where I saw my abdominal organs. I've never seen anything like that before. I woke up to a very itchy right arm that I scratched so hard, I made a sore. That had never happened before. It still itches occasionally. The very next day after this dream, this life form appeared in my bathtub drain. I am not making this up. It seemed to be some type of fungi but it reacted to water touching it and had tendrils that swayed in the water. I was honestly creeped by it. I don't know what the heck it was. I still beat myself up for not filming it when I first saw it poking about 6 inches up out of the drain. I didn't want to get close to it and decided to start showering in my parents' bathroom instead until it went away. It did but it came back in 2017 and seemed to have changed its shape or it may be a different life form altogether. It appeared more ruffle-like with holes in it but it stayed curled up in the drain instead of poking out. Again, everything I just typed is 100% true. I have nothing to gain for sharing my accounts other than the hope of helping others feel less like outcasts because of their experiences. A few months ago, I was on a hike in the state forest and ended up on one of the rural roads in the area. I found an abandoned house and took a look around. When I came out, some guy was across the street, eyeing me. I told him I was just taking a look. I definitely look like a hiker. 
He was cool, and we ended up shooting the breeze for a while. At one point, he brings up messing with kids at night. If he sees kids parked out on one of the roads or partying near his house, he literally makes urban legend come to life. The dude sneaks out at night and bangs on trees. He's my hero. On April 11, 2012, I received a call from the man who, along with his girlfriend, had a frightening encounter with a strange creature on November 20, 2011, outside of Troy in Bradford County, Pennsylvania. The fellow told me that what they saw scared the hell out of us. I was able to interview the woman involved on April 26, 2012. After conducting extensive interviews with the driver and his girlfriend I learned the following details. At about 11 to 5 p.m. that evening, they were driving onto Mud Creek Road traveling west towards Highway 14 near Troy. As they continued down the dark road, their attention was drawn to the left side of the roadway. The man, who was the driver, saw some movement and mentioned it to his friend. The woman initially thought that a naked man was crawling on the side of the road. The driver decreased his speed swerved his truck in the middle of the road and directed the high beams of his headlights towards the subject. The driver stopped about 30 to 40 feet away. They soon realized that this was not a person, but instead a creature that was crawling very low to the ground. As they watched, the creature moved into a squatting position with its back completely straight, somewhat like the stance of a kangaroo. The arms of the creature were held tightly to its body. What looked like long claws that resembled the talons of an eagle were easily visible. The claws were estimated to be about 8 to 10 inches in length. One claw was shorter than the other three. The creature had a muscular body. The head of the beast appeared to be oversized and shaped like that of a wolf. At the top of its head were two pointed bat-like ears that looked to be about 4 to 6 inches long. The entire creature, according to the man, was covered with dull wrinkly dark black skin. The man described seeing large canine-like teeth in its mouth. The eyes of the creature were about the size of a silver dollar and were shiny black. The man stated that even though he had his high beams directed at the creature, the eyes did not reflect at all. The man said he looked over the body during the 12 seconds encounter, and for some reason thought the creature should have wings, but none were apparent. In the squatted position, the creature seemed to be about 5 feet tall. At this point, the creature was in the left lane of the road and about 1 to 2 feet onto the pavement. As the couple watched in amazement, the creature began to stretch its body. The man said that at this point the animal started to stand up on its back legs while also falling over onto its front feet. The driver said that in this position, the creature seemed to be about 6 to 7 feet tall. The animal then fell over on all four legs. The witnesses observed that the front claws of the creature was now two feet across the center line of the highway, while the back feet remain one two feet from the edge of the road. The creature then turns its head to the right and looked towards the vehicle. The driver told me that it looked directly at them, with a horrific expression, like it was panicked. The fellow saw it take a deep breath. He had the feeling that the creature didn't realize that it was being observed and when it realized it was it was like it was caught doing something. Once it realized it was being observed, it leaned back slightly and then reached forward with its claws. The creature then took one tremendous leap and cleared a seven-foot embankment and moved out of sight into a wooded area. The man estimated that leap was about 40 feet long. As it was in the process of leaping, it was perfectly straight and held its front claws forward. The legs, as it was leaping, were only slightly larger than broomsticks or about the size of a walking crane and were very long. Then just a second after the creature was gone from sight something else had occurred. A large bird, possibly an owl, suddenly rushed at the passenger side window, almost hitting the glass, then took off and did not return. It happened so fast they were unsure if it was an owl or not. The witnesses indicated that this creature appeared to be changing form. The driver said, its shape was nothing like when it was squatted. The woman stated to me that it shaped into another form. She thought it was a dark brown color, 
and looked like a werewolf with a little back hair. She estimated that when it was leaping into the woods, she thought it stood about nine feet tall. The woman while reluctant to say it said, I think it was a man changing into a werewolf. The man after the experience went onto the internet to try to figure out what he saw, and told me that the closest way he could describe the creature would be a gargoyle with no wings. The man commented, I will never forget what we saw that night. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.